recorded live from Studio 12A in sunny Phoenix, Arizona. You're listening to the Josh and Friends Podcast. Hello, welcome to the Josh and Friends Podcast. I am your host. My name is Josh. And in today's episode, we are here to discuss a topic that I've wanted to bring up for some time now. And to help out with the discussion, I've decided to bring on a couple of music experts to help me out. First up is Lee Olson. Lee brings a wealth of knowledge to the table with his expertise on bands ranging from Clutch to Goodness and Roger Klein to his lesser known acts such as Beluga who thrived within the Washington State pawn shop circuit throughout the mid 90s. And then we have the old school metal guru himself, Mr. Ethan McDonald. And this is the man who helped me discover bands like Suicidal Tendencies and Megadeth way back in the early 90s. And he's also extremely knowledgeable in the genres of thrash and British heavy metal. And last, but certainly not least, is myself. I kicked around the music industry both on and off the air for many years, working at radio stations in the Seattle area. Formats ranged from hard rock to oldies, classic rock, and even country. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome back to the show, Mr. Lee Olson and Ethan McDonald. Guys, welcome to the show. How are you? I think we're both well. I think we were both waiting for each other to talk. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah, so we have Ethan McDonald. We have Lee Olson. We have uh, some real music experts here today. No. We have what? some guys that, <laughs> that have some opinions. <laughs> All right, all right. I'll, I'll settle Ethan, for that. Ethan might be an expert. I would give no, you and I'm, Ethan are, are music experts. I'm not. <laughs> I'm a very limited scope to my expertise, and it's usually music that nobody else wants to listen to. That's all what right. an expert is, though. If you had broad expertise, it wouldn't be expertise. <laughs> oh, there you go. All right, guys. So we're just going to start it all off here. So today's topic is a very fascinating one to me, and I'm looking forward to the discussions on this one. So here we are today to discuss who the greatest replacement singers are. Now, uh, of course, these are just our opinions, and we'll be interested to hear everybody else's take after the episode. And just for reference, if anybody wants to check out the YouTube link that I posted down below, I put together some examples of each band's first lead singer, followed by the replacement singer, and uh, just so you could get an idea of, you know, the ones that we're talking about. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to scan over these bands a little. We're going to give a little history, some background, and we're going to give our take on these bands and singers. And at the very end, at the very end, we're going to give our own top three selections with uh, maybe a runner up. So how does that sound? Sounds fantastic. All yeah, right. I'm in. So let's do this. All right. So now before we kick this off, I just wanted to point out why I selected everyone here. Now, I'm more of like the mainstream rock, pop, classic rock kind of guy. Ethan, how about yourself? How, how would you describe yourself and your, uh, your tastes and your background? My background is definitely, I was raised in butt rock by my older stepsister, our foster sister. And so I went to a bunch of butt rock concerts and I affectionately call it butt rock, but that 80s glam stuff. Then yeah. I became full on metalhead, got into like gangster rap. Uh, now like a lot of alternative. So, I mean, just... But I yeah. know a lot of the classic stuff thanks to good people like Josh Matlock. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of more that's kind of more my my jam. Right on, right on. And and Lee, how about you, man? Like, uh, now how would you describe your taste? You're you're more of like a mixed bag. You never I'm a know. Weirdo. <laughs> I'm a weirdo. Yeah, I mean not as weird as as some people we know. I mean like, Rachitz has some really <laughs> eclectic tastes that cross a lot of boundaries. But I'm I like rock, I right? Like metal. Uh, yeah. I also like Avril Lavigne. So you're right. You know. Um, <laughs> Awesome, awesome. I'm a mixed bag. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. I like a little Avril Lavigne. Yeah, you can. You know, hey, it's everything. Hey, listen, all of our tastes are a little bit complicated. Okay, so, all right. (laughs) Well played. (laughs) All right. So now for the rock and roll replacement singers, we're gonna go in alphabetical order. So right off the bat, we have the rock band, the legendary rock band ACDC, formed in Australia in 1973 by brothers Malcolm and Angus Young. The first lead singer was the legendary Bon Scott. And uh, what were some of uh, Bon Scott's biggest known songs? Ethan? I'll tell you what, uh, you know, I like to go back to some of those classics like Dirty Deeds. Yes. TNT. Um, I love anyone who chokes on vomit. That's a big, that's a big, (laughs) especially if it's your own. I mean, you know, somebody else's, that's exciting. But um, no, I mean, just the Highway to Hell album from start to finish is just unreal. 
to me. It's just Agreed. Like, Agreed. You know, a lot of people don't even know that Bon Scott was the original lead singer. They, a lot of people don't even know that they had two lead singers. I, I, right. I, it's weird. Right. Which They're, is incredible. No, I and looking at at uh, I mean, like Ethan said, the entire Highway to Hell album is is ridiculous, and any of that stuff is really great. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think without sort of jumping the gun on which you know replacement singers are the best, a lot of you you nailed it when you said a lot of people don't know that they switched singers and they had, right. they were really successful before Brian Johnson, and then they were massively successful after too. So it's it's a little bit different. To, I don't know. I like yeah what they managed to do is incredible agreed agreed yeah I, you gotta love you know that highway to hell album is like their big breakthrough uh in the states and then of course then uh, bon scott died my personal favorite song by him was uh long way to the top if you want to rock and roll it's a great yeah. great song great song um that's I, I believe that's the only song that brian johnson refused to sing in concert because he goes that's a bond song so but yeah, so he actually, uh, Bon Scott actually died of alcohol poisoning, like Ethan mentioned. He choked on his own vomit in the, uh, like an alley or something in front of someone's house or something like that, in his car. Um, died on February 20th, 1980. And then we bring in Brian Johnson. Brian Johnson came in and uh, even had even bigger hits with uh, You Shook Me All Night Long, Thunderstruck, Back in Black. What do you guys think of uh, old gritty Brian Johnson? Yeah, he's unreal. I mean, it, like you said, the fact that there was a transition and most people didn't even notice, but at the same time, uh, I like a lot of those songs. I like the, but they just didn't have complete albums. And you could argue some of the early ACDC were not necessarily complete albums either. There's songs there that were hits, but um, maybe Back in Black is the closest thing after Brian Johnson joined, but it yeah. just, man, I'm telling you, just the Bon Scott stuff, uh, they did a little edgier, a little younger or something. I just, from start to finish, I just feel like those albums offer more for me as a fan. But that's that's my opinion. I like how nasty he is. He's like, oh, he's like, <laughs> it's one I, blood it, is yeah. a just gets me going. Like I can listen to that still in the waiting room, or whatever. Just get pumped up. I just love it. Right? Yeah, it's great stuff. Great stuff. Uh, you know what was funny? I was like reading some of this, and uh, I find it interesting that the one of the last places I could ever imagine that Back in Black album being recorded was where it was actually recorded. It was recorded in the Bahamas. You guys, uh, did you guys know that? No. That Isn't that bizarre? Right. No, it's right. It's true. It's a famous like, no, I mean, recording I'm sure studio. it's true. It just yeah. doesn't, yeah, it doesn't match. The, so, I, yeah, you don't, you don't imagine him singing, you know, any of that album sitting around in like a, a floral print shirt and <laughs> right. shorts. You think of like a gritty, dirty, old studio somewhere very dark, you know, lit. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but I guess uh, he, that's where he came up with the lyrics. I, rumor has it, by the way, that uh, Bon wrote half of the lyrics of that song. But um, you know, who's gonna prove that? Um, but uh, so no, there's a there's a line in that song. I guess there was a huge storm, and it was like just crushing the studio and stuff like that. And and he got those lines: uh, and the walls start shaking, the earth was quaking. My mind. You know, like that that line right there. And I'm like, whoa, he got that from like that song. That's crazy. So. That's pretty rad. I, I think that particular album too is is crazy because coming off of Highway to Hell, Highway to Hell preceded this one, right? That was Bon Scott's yeah. last album. Yep. 79 and 1980. I mean, Highway to Hell and then the very first song on Back in Black is Hell's Bells oh, so and good. sort of that continuation. Yeah. And then, and then, I mean, like Ethan said, I think, I think Back in Black, the or at least the track Back in Black was a declaration that Brian Johnson was fully the, the complete new singer. Like there was no, right. no question about it. Agreed. Yeah. I think it was roofing and shit like that before the, he got the call. Josh, I have a question for you too. And maybe you know, or maybe that did Bond, how much was Bon Scott a part of writing the music of ACDC? Was he just lyrics or did he have the, the chops to like write riffs and things like that? Do you know? Man, that's a good question, man. I think that he was the, uh, the lyricist and the other boys were like the, the musicians, but okay. completely so you speculating. How much Back in Black was maybe written with the intention of Bond singing it, you know, like before all that went down and, I wonder, like, I'm sure they probably haven't talked about that a whole lot because they wanted to move on. But, you know, just one of those things, kind of like when Metallica yeah. lost their bassist, you know, how much right. of that was. Yeah, no, I, I heard that they thought about quitting. And I'm like, oh, man, can you imagine if they quit? Like, uh, but they did get the blessing from, you know, his mom, the old, you know, he would have wanted, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So ACDC, legendary band, one of the greatest replacement singers of all time. No one's going to ever question that. Uh, next band on the list, Seattle's own. Alice in Chains, oh. one of my favorite bands from the uh, 90s, formed in Seattle back in 1987. Lane Staley 
was the main lead singer for the band's biggest hits. Not all the songs, but the biggest hits, probably. You know, the most recognizable songs. Everything from uh, Man in the Box and Rooster and No Excuses, Down in a Hole. All the good stuff. Did either of you guys get a chance to see Alice in Chains live in concert? Yes, I did. But I didn't know what I was seeing at the time because they opened for... Oh, I want to wow. say it was Megadeth, Anthrax, and Slayer in one of these shows like when I was in ninth or 10th grade. Oh, man. That's awesome. I, I didn't know them. Yeah, I didn't know them at the time. They played stuff off the facelift, and I'm like, who are these guys? This is what got my attention. That is awesome. That yeah, is great. Like, That's unreal. Right. And, like, his voice is just so – I mean, even my wife, and she's not a big, you know, heavy metal kind of alternative, but with all the Seattle stuff that I listen to and still jam, she just goes – that's one of the most incredible voices. You could argue all four Seattle bands, the big four of the grunge right. era, all were unbelievable vocalists in their own right. But that's the thing. I've, I've just I had to do some homework because I've, I've heard this a few tracks, but I hadn't really heard. And I was really interested to hear what he sounded like singing the original Alice in Chains songs that, that Lane was the lead vocalist on. And I found some video just doing homework to get ready for tonight. And uh, it was I, I would have to say I was kind of impressed, but it's still no Lane. Right. You're talking about the replacement singer, right? Yeah. Uh, William, William Duvall. Duvall, is that well, what? Yeah. Well, it's funny because I actually saw William Duvall in concert with them as the new, whatever they are, Alice in Chains new group. You know, they're good. Uh, I went because I was like, you know what? I could still hear uh, a good third of the songs because what's his name? Sings about, you know, a third of their big songs and everything. And he, you know, he's the genius of the group. So uh, Jerry Cantrell was actually sick that day. So he didn't oh. sing any songs. And I was like... And I was like, yeah, but what's the name? It looks hella cool. He fits the bill. He's he's good. He's he's okay. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it's just, it's never the same, like, if someone's singing the other person's song, in my opinion, you know? And some of these shouldn't even be that, like, I get that they had to name it Alice in Chains, but after Lane Staley died, he was too big a part of yeah. it. He was too big. You can replace you know, certain members of bands if they didn't have a huge impact. And and that's probably what, I mean, that's why this list is going to be forever debatable. Well, maybe uh, because is what it? are the, what's the standard is the standard that you sound like him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or is the standard that they had success before and then they continued success or, you know, I, I mean, it's really hard to say because to me, William Duvall isn't part of Alice in Chains. He's the part that allows them to continue touring and making money. Right. But, but here's <laughs> the, here's the argument to that. Jerry Cantrell is the true, I mean, Lane Staley wrote some songs, but Jerry Cantrell was, he's the mind of that band. I mean, in my opinion, oh, like, true. if you look but, at the, but most of the lyrics, yeah. well, I won't, I can say that most of the lyrics before Lane Staley died were Lane Staley's lyrics. Yes. So all the music was Jerry Cantrell and all the harmony and all that other stuff, but almost all the lyrics were Lane. Well, the songs and most of the time too. it was Lane talking about doing heroin. Yeah. The heartbreaking <laughs> addiction stories, all the pain. I mean, it's like, it's some of the darkest, but just like almost melodic and, and painfully beautiful. The realities of life that I just, I mean, lyrically, that band hit me as, as much as they did musically as well. And that's a, that's pretty awesome. That doesn't happen very often, I feel. Yes, yeah, me too. And, and that's why I think that, like, in this case, this one doesn't even belong. William Duvall is not a replacement singer for Lane Staley. He's not. He yeah, can, and they've he had hits. Mimic, he can mimic some of the sounds. And they've had hits, but they've been done by Jerry Cantrell. Like, it's been him right. singing, you know, It's Your Decision and California, whatever that song is. Um, all right, so moving on. Our next band is part of the famous Big Four, Anthrax, formed in New York City back in 1981. The classic lineup was with Joey Belladonna, 1984, and I'm sure, Ethan, you have the most insight on this one. What are your uh, favorite songs from the uh, Belladonna era? Belladonna era, I mean, my Lord, there's so many great ones, but if you go like to Among the Living and just all the great songs, most about like Stephen King books and all sorts of crazy stuff that that Anthrax sang songs about, like I Am the Law, about Judge Dredd. I mean, just total skater kind of like metal band, a blast. And yeah. when Belladonna left, uh, I think we were all pretty bummed. We thought the band might even break up. And uh, I have to say that John Bush, because he didn't sound anything like Joey Belladonna, because I always thought Joey Belladonna was kind of like the heavy metal version of Steve Perry. And uh, he just had this kind of weird voice that didn't really fit for metal, but it just kind of worked. When I play old Anthrax, my wife goes, why is this guy singing? He's out of tune half the time. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I never noticed it. When you're a young teenage kid, you don't care about that stuff. It's like, this song's awesome. That's funny, man. Yeah, and I'm like, uh. and John Bush was like, I think from a band called 
man, you might have to check down this like armored saint or something before he joined anthrax. And he brought just a whole different, like he wasn't trying to be Joey Belladonna. Yeah. And it was, uh, it completely sounds like a different band. It does, but it was just a little more mature, a little more yeah. of an adult sound rather than that kind of skater punk style. And just really, <laughs> I liked it a lot, Yeah, uh, but it, it was a wholesale shift. You're absolutely right. It almost sounds like a different band. I always loved the song. And this is probably why it always reminds me of, uh, Eric Goodman when he yeah. played that be all end all song for me on the bus he goes hey listen to this song and i was like i was like this is awesome dude so yeah i always like that song uh what was your favorite john bush song oh geez john bush song probably something right off of the sound of white noise it's the first album with john bush they had oh my gosh like a song called invisible that i really like i mean there was a ton of songs off of uh the next one too dimebag daryl even was like a guest appearance on guitar from from pantera on some of the tracks there, because I think at some point they lose their lead guitarist too, Danny Sp- I think Uh-oh. Danny Sp- But it was just, they just keep kind of evolving and changing and putting out music and uh, uh, just a great band live. Honestly, I only saw them live with Belladonna and one of the most crazy concerts I've ever been to was when they came with Public Enemy to Seattle. And I was like scared for my life the entire concert because I didn't know what was going on, <laughs> if there was going to be like a race war or something. Just, it was a while, but the crowd all got along well. It was amazing to see these hardcore rap fans along with these hardcore metal fans. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. I am the man and stuff. <laughs> oh, my Lord. It's yeah, awesome. it was just, yeah, it was wild, but it was fun. It was the last stop of their entire tour, too, so they were blowing oh. out of the time of their life. So it was awesome. It was incredible, but yeah, they were they were great live as well. Lee, did you, uh, did you ever get into Anthrax? What about you, man? Uh, no, I mean a little bit, but I mean, it was well, just like attack of the killer bees or whatever though. Like, right. I right. Almost, I like some no of that way. weird stuff that you played me too, Ethan. <laughs> like you fucking yeah. are you fucking are. Yep. That's good stuff. This song's about censorship. <laughs> they hated censorship and Tipper Gore. Yep. <laughs> All right. So next on our list is bad company formed in Surrey, England back in 1973. You guys remember that? You guys remember when they formed it? Uh, Led by former free singer, Paul Rogers. So uh, huge songs back in the day. Can't get enough. Rock and roll fantasy. Feel like making love. What do you guys think of that group? What do you guys think of Bad Company? Meh. <laughs> they, this, is, this is where my uh, my attitude on a lot of music yeah. that I just wasn't into is going to come into play. Right, right. I just never got into You weren't in high school when this came out. This didn't really connect yeah. with you. Uh, no, but you I, know I what? Agree. Like, I mean, I can connect to kind of older music if it connects, but like, I just never did with Bad Company, so I'm not going to be any authority on these guys at all. <laughs> this is what this is all about, man. It's uh, it's all about opinions here. So, uh, Paul Rogers left to form the group The Firm with Jimmy Page, and oh, wow. Brian Howe stepped in as the replacement to Paul Rogers in 1986. And I actually saw this guy live in Manson, Washington. That yeah. shows you how well the band did yeah. after this. <laughs> My brother's like, yeah, Bad Company's uh, supposed to be playing here. And I go, Bad Company? What? Bad Company? And I'm like, you, no. Are you, are you serious? And he goes, yeah. And I go, I go, wait a minute. Wait a minute. All right. Back up here. Back up here. Which which lead singer is this? And he goes, uh, uh, Brian Howe? And I'm like, oh, okay. Gotcha. All right. No, I mean, I guess this guy had some uh, mm, fairly big hits back in like mainstream rock hits. You know, they they charted, but nobody ever remembers any of the songs that he did like holy water and whatever uh and then i guess he died of uh a heart attack last year in 2020 so uh so yeah always uh leave him laughing josh all right uh (laughs) next up we have the pioneers of heavy metal black sabbath yeah formed in birmingham england in 1968 and fronted by the prince of darkness himself ozzy osbourne So, uh, Ethan, just going to automatically go to Ethan on a couple of these here. You you Uh, should default to Ethan on most of these. (laughs) Good gosh. No, sir. All right. I'll take Black Sabbath. Okay. All right. (laughs) All right. So, Ethan, what do you think about Black Sabbath? Uh, What are some of your favorite songs by Black Sabbath? My Lord. They talk about the founders of heavy metal. You actually said that, Josh, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it's crazy because obviously I came to Black Sabbath later and even like Zeppelin. My dad would tell me about how great they were. And I'm like, come on, dad. And then you go back and go, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So Dark. Paranoid is obviously yeah. the first song you kind of caught your interest or, or Iron Man. But if you go back to like Nativity in Black or something like the original yeah. song, just Black Sabbath, I swear yeah. it sounds like Satan is coming out of the ground. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. It's yeah, it's like, what am I listening to? Is this? It sounds like a soundtrack of like Halloween or something like that. You're like, what is going yeah. on here? Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then you're like, okay, well, it can't be that creepy. But then you look at the cover of that album, you're like, oh, my God. 
what is going well, on here? <laughs> Ozzy's voice too is just haunting and right. crazy and just so yeah, yeah, it's one of it's a kind. Great. Obviously, why he's so iconic. But exactly, exactly. So uh, yeah, Paranoid, The Wizard. I mean, there's the list goes on and on. They 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 were a solid band. Um, in the Sky. There's so many that are kind of like not yeah. huge ones too, like Symptom of the Universe that are just amazing songs that not many people know unless they do a deep dive either. Right. Yeah. No, I heard an interview with. What was his name? Uh, Spashing Pumpkins, Corgan, oh, Billy, Billy Corgan. Corgan yeah. And he's like, it's my favorite band of all time. Wow. And so someone, someone goes, so, someone thought he was joking. He goes, I'm serious. They're my favorite band of all time. I'm like, okay. And it's a cool trippy yeah. stuff too. Like I heard a song by this uh, blue singer named Charles Bradley. Mm-hmm. And he covered a song called Changes. It's an original Ozzy Osbourne, like Black Sabbath right. song. Yes. Huge, huge hit off of that. And I'm like, that's a Black Sabbath song. What the? <laughs> no one would ever know it. Yeah. It is weird. You're like, wait, this is Black Sabbath? Well, interesting. All right. All right. So uh, famously, Ozzy was fired from the band and replaced by Ronnie James Dio in yeah. 1979. Now, Dio, he's, he's a legend just by himself. You a fan of uh, Dio? I, no. <laughs> I <laughs> respect you- that he's like rock and roll royalty. And they had a couple songs, honestly. And he had his own, obviously, like solo career that had a couple songs that catch my ear. But it's just like, to me, it was, I got to a point where it still sounded almost like Rainbow. Almost like- Butt rock. Isn't he a rain? He's a rainbow. Uh, yeah. Solo. He blacks out. So you didn't... <laughs> there was a couple big songs off that first album with Black Sabbath. Uh, do you, what was that? What were the songs on that album? I can't even think of what they are. Exactly. When, when he came into the picture and as I was going back to like listen to Sabbath, because clearly they've been around. I just, every time I listen to something with Ronnie James Dio, it just didn't catch me the same way. I mean, that's some cool riffs. Yeah. Tony yeah. Iommi is just an unreal guitarist and stuff and Geezer Butler and all, but it just, it just wasn't the same. And so I kind of just found myself always just going back and buying and purchasing all the old Aussie led Black Sabbath yeah. stuff, but not much of the James Dio. I don't think I have a single CD and I still have every CD I bought, which is embarrassing sitting in a cabinet, but uh, I don't have one with, with Ronnie James Dio as the front man of Sabbath, to be honest. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, yeah, I know that some girl bought me, their first album and i was like whoa i go that's the that's the first album with dio she didn't she didn't know she was like oh it is I'm like yeah <laughs> anyway uh so <laughs> all right so moving on uh lee's like jesus christ can we can we stop talking about ozzy osborne jesus uh oh, I don't care. we're not going to no, talk it's, about it, it's, it's worthy of discussion i'm just not an expert this the only next, thing i have to do yeah. with black sabbath is uh my only memory of Black Sabbath, I had a tape, a cassette tape of Black Sabbath. It was like one of the greatest hits. Yeah. And Bob Jones uh, happened to, he and I were talking and and I had it with me or something. He said, hey, can I borrow that? I was like, yeah. And lent it to him and, and never got it back. But honestly, <laughs> I, I was super stoked that he was he wanted to borrow a Black Sabbath tape. That's a better story than uh, if he returned it and said, hmm. it Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. not like I went hunting down like, come on, I got to get that cassette back from Bob. I was like, no, huh, I'm Bob Jones, you can have it. That's right. Awesome. Did you work the, the OzFest with us though, the year that all the original members of Black Sabbath came and were the headliner? Was that oh, God, where? Maybe. Uh, at the Gorge? Yeah, of course. I'm sure. Because uh, I want to say I, that was the OzFest where Marlo just about decapitated children when they pushed over the snow fence and tried to charge the stage. We were all, <laughs> my football guys were all security and Marlo was just an idiot. I started throwing haymakers and just knocking 12 year olds unconscious. I'm like, what are you doing, Marlo? <laughs> Right. I don't know. It's it just it broke the rules. It's like, no, Marlon, you can't kill children. <laughs> anyway, that's the. Oh, the love it. All right. Um, All right. So, Lee, you might be more into this band than, uh, say, uh, Ethan and I. All right. Uh, the pop punk band Blink 182 oh, formed right. in uh, Poway, California in 1992, fronted by guitarist and co lead singer Tom DeLong. And this band had a number of big hits back in the late 90s, early 2000s, with uh, Mark Hoppus uh, sang the songs What's My Age Again and Damn It. And then uh, the other lead singer, Tom DeLonge, he had the uh, songs First Date and All the Small Things. They're probably their biggest hit, actually. So what do you think of uh, Blink-182, Lee? Well, I'm no expert on these guys, but I do like them. I like pop punk stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think once they passed, so what is it? Uh, the first album was Matt something whatever um like a donkey or something like that on the cover or yeah i I mean and then and then they have the porn porn actress in the yeah i mean i guess i guess i can only comment that i liked it with tom DeLong. i can't say that i i spent a lot of time listening to it before that and they're super poppy super punky so like there isn't much depth there to say oh this person brought a ton of musicality or a ton of lyrical sophistication because that genre doesn't lend itself to that Um, right but i do like the tom DeLong stuff 
and then I think he went off and became like a weird UFO guy. Yeah, he went off to yeah. chase aliens in 2015. Um, yeah, and that's a, that's a way more interesting story than how most <laughs> rockers end. So, yeah. What about you, Ethan? You ever get into those guys? Yeah, I mean a little bit. They were obviously kind of catchy and kind of fun. Yeah. And uh, Lee and I's old roommate Robbie, you know, he kind of liked he liked a little bit of a Blink 182 and kind of maybe yeah. open my mind a little bit. Same with Lee because he liked like MXPX and some of that other kind of, I don't know, MXPX is technically pop punk, but. Oh, they are. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just so, yeah, I was like, yeah, this isn't bad. And they were, you know, they made asses of themselves and it was just kind of fun and enjoyable. But I didn't realize that he ever left the band other than I remember him being in a different group, maybe like Angels and Airwaves or something like that. Oh, and I don't right. know if that was a mm. side project or a, but yeah, yeah. I, did, I don't know that. I never bought a CD of theirs or anything. So I'm by no means a. Well, fashion. then Matt Skiba or Skiba, Skiba. I'm not sure how you say his name, but anyway. He took over as the other vocalist in 2000, I guess 2015, and he scored a top seven hit with the hot alternative song, Dark Side. I'm sure it's real dark. I'm sure it's real dark. Um, How many albums did they do with him? Like, I don't know. I think there's a couple, maybe. Maybe a couple albums. I don't, I don't know. But I, I don't think he sings a lot. Like on the, You know, it's like one of those things where it's kind of like the Alice in Chains kind of deal there. It's like, yeah, oh. Yeah, it's just they, they picked up some guy that they could still tour with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I saw that they were going to be at, I think this is like right when he left and he's going to be playing at the Phoenix open, which is a big, big event in Phoenix. And I was like, wait a minute, didn't that guy just leave? They're like, yeah, but they got a replacement guy. And I'm like, nah, nah, nah. I'm not interested <laughs> I'm in paying $50 to see this. I'm sorry. Right. Sorry. They're like, oh, suit yourself. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Uh, all right. So next up is the death metal band Cannibal Corpse formed in Buffalo, New York in 1988. Is that your favorite, Josh? Tell us about him. I'm going to say, I'm going to be honest here. I don't really know anything about this band, Ethan. So this is uh, this one's you, man. This is all you. I, I don't know a thing about them either. Death oh, metal yeah. went a little far. When, when bands started sounding like St. Bernard's eating a microphone, <laughs> uh, it just, it lost me. Like, I like at least some vocal talent. I mean, I think the... Closest I got was probably like Sepultura, some of the Brazilian bands. You could definitely argue mm -hmm. they were not great vocalists, but at least I could understand their words even through a thick Portuguese accent. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll tell you what. Corpse. I'll tell right. you what, Ethan. The only thing that I really know about the band Cannibal Corpse is that they appeared in the classic film Ace Ventura: Pet Detective <laughs> in 1994. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's You're all I know. That's too, so yeah, we can move so on. so apparently, yeah, their their uh, lead singer uh, Chris Barnes was the lead singer from 1988 to 1985, and then uh, George Fisher replaced him in 1995, and nobody ever knew it. So yeah. on to the next song. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, come on, man, that's that doesn't take talent. All right, so I don't know. I mean, it, I'll surprise you guys. Like, I I can dig some of this metal. I don't know much about Cannibal Corpse, but there's some cool metal out there that has that sort of lack of. of I'll tell you uh, what vocal. I and, respect and I, that. I still think I dig it. But but since this whole conversation is about best replacement singers, <laughs> we could probably leave that genre completely out because you probably can't tell who the singer is. Uh, it is it is crazy though. I've always had that question with the super hardcore singers where how are they even able to tour like a couple days after with singing like that? It's insane. So I, I always wondered if did they get like, you know how steroids like a lot of people take steroids, but not just for, you know, being strong or weightlifting and stuff like that. It's to recover. So I think, mo I think most yeah. rock singers take steroids. Yeah, I, I, that's, I, that's a huge deal. I, yeah. I, yeah, I, I would think so, especially those guys. Well, once again, I'd imagine if you're just basically sounding like you're super hoarse anyway, maybe you just got to keep your voice super hoarse and it doesn't matter because it's not like you're having to hit yeah. the high note. Well, yeah, yeah, I guess. But at a certain point, I mean, I guess uh, it's a lot of that is technique, like the uh, the old uh, drill sergeants yeah. back in the you know back in the old days. Well, and as as a guy who has torn the sh shit out of my voice doing karaoke, I can say <laughs> I definitely didn't have any any technique. But you can destroy your voice because you certainly it's hard to do that. Yeah, <laughs> it is really hard. Yeah. Well, Lee, maybe you can get a hold of some roids and and uh, bring back your karaoke singing career. Yeah, or get rid of my man boobs. That's oh, whoa, sick. wow. Wow, that took a dark turn. All right. So it's impressive though. They're still <laughs> making music. I was just looking them up on Spotify and they have an album. Like they've been doing music for damn near 30 years. That's impressive. Wow. That's a, that's amazing. Well, you learn something new every day. All right. Okay, so on to our next act. They are one of the more successful bands on this list, uh, at least for a couple decades they were. The band Chicago 
Oh, yeah. Formed in 1967 in the city of Chicago. There's basically two eras of this group, the Brass Rock era and then the Peter Cetera era. Uh, so what do you guys think of the band Chicago? I know I saw them in concert with you, John. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Yeah, we all went to that yeah. together. <laughs> then we may have held hands on the grass lawn. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Only for the Peter Cetera songs, though, so that should tell you Well, something. you know, I, if you guys remember this, I wasn't actually there to see Chicago because uh, right. Peter Cetera was not there, and he hadn't been there for several years at that point. I was there to see Hall & Oates. That's what mm -hmm. I was there to oh, see. Oh, yeah. Huge yeah. Hall & Oates guy. <laughs> but anyway, so Cetera's most recognizable songs with the band Chicago include uh, 25 or 6 to 4, yeah. Feeling Stronger Every Day, Just You and Me. And then they get they, they start getting like softer and softer. So like if you leave me now, uh, hard to say I'm sorry. You're the inspiration. You know, all, all, everybody knows these songs. They're like you know classic uh, adult contemporary kind of deals there. And he was one of three lead singers in the band. And a lot of people said they lost their edge when they lost that guitarist of theirs. Uh, and uh, he blew his head off uh, while he's uh, trying to clean his gun, uh, which is a horrible story. If you guys ever see the uh, documentary that wow. those guys are still not over that. They are like shaken to the core by that guy doing that. Like, it, it's it's crazy. But um, Yeah, public service announcement. Yeah. Unload your weapons before you clean them. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. Well, he said he used to get drunk and, like, just clean his weapons. And don't like be that. drunk while you're yeah. cleaning your weapons. Maybe that's a better <laughs> that's thing. That's another one, yeah. <laughs> just changing lives today, Lee. I love that about you. Wow. Well, I love we're it. We're looking out for people. So, in 1985, Peter Cetera left and was replaced with Jason Sheff, who was a 23-year-old, you know, blonde guy that, Kind of looked like Peter Cetera, you know, kind of fit the bill. Uh, but they pretty much did the same exact formula with the soft rock genre with the same producer, whatever his face was. Uh, the guy that ended up doing like Whitney Houston and stuff like that. Uh, anyway. All right. Cool. Moving on. Moving on to the next band, the hard rock band of Deep Purple formed yeah. in Hertford, England, 1968. Ian Gillian came on in 1969. So like a year after that. And uh, they enjoyed their biggest success with this, this guy. So Smoke on the Water, Highway Star, My Woman from Tokyo, Space Trucking, all those good songs, right? But did you guys know that David Coverdale uh, was the lead singer that replaced him in 1973? No, David Coverdale. How do I know that name? David Coverdale was from, in White Snake. Yeah. And then he was in Coverdale Page, of course. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? No so. Yeah, no, and uh, that's, I guess that was the, the thing on Deep Purple is th it took them so long to get in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because they always had massive changes in personnel. There was always a change in that group, and people were like, who is Deep Purple? They're like, we love Deep Purple, but who who are they? Like, <laughs> you can't question how great they were, though. They had massively influential songs, and, and that big album Machine Head was, like, just legendary. So, all right, moving on. How about... The Doobie Brothers. Everyone knows the Doobie Brothers. Formed in... Nah, not me. I mean, I know who they are, but I'll have no opinion on the Doobie Brothers. <laughs> oh, Lee, here we go. Formed in San Jose, California in 1970. The band has two very, very distinct sounds and genres. And uh, because Lee has no opinion, uh, Ethan, are you familiar with any Doobie Brothers songs? Yeah, China Grove, right? That's one yep, of them? Yep, yep. I remember, and I can listen to the music. I mean, how do you not know? Oh, oh, oh yeah. listen to the music. Yeah. I think that song, when I listen to that song, if you listen to that song with like headphones, it's so amazing, like sonically amazing, like the way it's produced. It's I think it's produced by the same guy that did all the Van Halen stuff. So they're getting into the streets is them too, isn't it? Yeah. So basically, yeah. so so China Grove, Long Train Running, listen to the music. Those are the big Tom Johnson songs. And then he started having health problems and he had to take a break. And then the band's like, well, you know, we're kind of, you know, big right now and kind of don't want to take a break because uh, you. So, uh, so they brought on... Michael McDonald to fill what? in his spot in 1975. Wow. Then they had uh, they had massive hits with Michael McDonald. Uh, what a fool believes, taking it to the streets, minute by minute. Lee Lee doesn't like the Tom Johnson era, but he loves the Michael McDonald era. I may. I mean, I probably like a lot of their songs. I can say, looking I'm at their joking. Wikipedia page right now, they had great mustaches. Yeah, oh, they did. Through they, all eras. Well, and and Michael McDonald had a great beard. Uh, and he he's one of those guys that like he started going like gray at like I don't know what I don't know how old he was, but he looked like he was like you know 45 when he was like 22 or something like that. You're like, well, who's this old aged? Uh, Man, that must you know, suck to go gray. Right. Early. <laughs> if I have to hear Yamo be there one more time, I'm gonna burn this. Yamo burn place. this place to the ground. <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah. But anyway, uh, what a fool believes. You know that that song was uh, co-written by Kenny Loggins. You yeah. Like you like that? You like that? Wow. Like that. A lot of cocaine being done when that was recorded. Yes, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> All right. Now we are going to get on to the next band here. How about Faith No More, formed ah. in San Francisco in 1979. The original singer was Chuck Mosley, and. Uh, we had some mild success with him, like uh, with that. I found out about the song through Ethan. We care a lot. Love that song. Love that song. Lee, how do you feel about uh, Faith No More, buddy? Yeah, man. Well, I, Faith No More was definitely one of those that, uh, first of all, they deserve way more credit and press than they ever got. But second, they, the first singer was so different from Mike Patton. Yes. That it's it, yeah, they had that hit, and it was, but it was just kind of a nothing hit. There was no real musicality to it. Sure. It was just kind of good bass, catchy. It was just kind of catchy and it just yeah. kind of happened. And then they replaced that dude with Mike Patton and Mike Patton brings, he's a nut. He's crazy, but he's also a genius with a ridiculous vocal range. He, that he's dude good. can flat wail. And I think it took, it changed faith no more from a band that was sort of pop and weird and sort of directionless to a rock band. And yeah. the record with, uh, Epic and, uh, I mean, I can't even remember all the songs off the top of my head. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, when you listen to that thing, I mean, if you listen to We Care A Lot, yeah, and then you listen to, going back to like a Black Sabbath thing, <laughs> they cover War Pigs on that. If you if you yeah. listen back to back, We Care A Lot with the first singer and the cover of War Pigs with Mike Patton singing, <laughs> holy shit, he'll blow you out of the water because he has tremendous range. He's a ridiculous singer. Uh, he's a total weirdo, um, but he... I don't know. He completely changed that band. Well, yeah, and they, they got bigger with him. The first lead singer is kind of like just kind of like shouting, like, we yeah. care a lot. <laughs> you know, it was just different. It was cool. just different. Like, it I was, like it, but I, yeah, I always but, got that song that, stuck in my head because of the bass. Dun, dun, ding, 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 ding. Right. But that's that's it. one of the things right. I think Mike Patton allowed them to do is yeah. they were a great musical band. And most of the writing didn't come from even from Mike Patton when he joined. It was uh, James Martin and and a couple of the other band guys that were making the music. But with that first format, sort of that, ding, 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 just sort of that, yeah. there wasn't they they couldn't stretch their legs, and I feel like when they when they got Mike Patton and they were allowed to stretch their legs musically, th they became a whole different band. And I mean, there's some stuff later on, like if you listen to like Ashes to Ashes, uh, you can hear Mike Patton's vocal range, and he just destroys all of it. So to me, they're two different bands, but it's pretty cool that they had some success with We Care a Lot. Which is kind of baffling. It's not a great song, but then <laughs> really angry Mike Patton came in and and it was a completely different band. Yeah, but better, and and I think that's that's I, the anomaly because most of the time yeah. when bands see success and they replace the singer, it, it kind of goes downhill if it changes a lot. I personally in this case, they went up. Miss you karaokeing easy. Yeah, the song. Easy. Oh, dude, well, I mean, but that's a great example. He, he does. He did a Lionel Richie song yeah. and he killed it. Yeah, I mean, he did it. He did a Black Sabbath song. He killed it. Uh, he listened to the weird stuff he does with Mr. Bungle and some of the. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to go down the hole with Mike Patton, but he's he's a genius and a fantastic singer. And I think those guys stumbled into him, and it's he awesome. really allowed Faith No More to start being a musical band rather than just sort of a weird niche poppy nothing band. Yeah, yeah. No, there's some good tunes there, and if people are listening that haven't checked them out. Go ahead and do it. I put a couple of yeah, songs to, in the uh, Listen to Ashes play. to Ashes yeah. and tell me Mike Patton isn't better than the guy that's saying we care a lot. <laughs> All right. Okay. For the next band on the list, we have out of London, England in 1967. That's when they were formed in 1967. Fleetwood Mac. The band who will forever remind me of Danny Marsh. Indeed. So the early days of this band were focused more on blues and rock. Uh, Peter Green, who was the original frontman, did songs like Oh Well, which is a pretty badass song. You know, on the guitar, if you guys haven't heard that. That's my best because I can we can't. Sound kind of like Beavis there. I, that's what I'm going for. That's what I'm going for. And then they had also the, uh, the song Albatross and the original Black Magic Woman. That was their uh, their song. Um, Bob Welch actually took over his spot in 1971. They had a few big songs like Sentimental Lady and Hypnotized and songs like that. But it was not until 1975 Bob Welch had left and 
They added guitarist Lindsey Buckingham and witchy woman herself, Stevie Nicks. So, Ethan, what do you think about Fleetwood Mac? I'll tell you what. Uh, my dad was also a huge fan and stuff like that. I, like This is one of those bands, again, like the Fleetwood Mac. I didn't realize all the history behind like the other singers and the success they had because to me, the only thing that's Fleetwood Mac is when you have Lindsey Buckingham right. and you have Stevie Nicks. So, uh, once again, to, for like Lee was saying, for Faith No More, when you get new singers that probably changed the sound and the direction of the band and you only get bigger and more successful. I mean, that's, that's super impressive. Yeah. And they're, they got big. I mean, oh, to, yeah. to say that, to say that they, uh, they didn't get bigger and more popular. Uh, my, my dad was still, uh, even, even today, he was like, you know, I like, uh, I like Peter green. I like the Peter green fluid Mac. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Okay. But uh, you can't deny bringing them both on. The, the famous story is uh, Mick Fleetwood met him uh, at Sound City. Yeah. And uh, he just heard the song and he was like, dude, who the hell is that? And he goes, oh, it's, you know, this Lindsey Buckingham guy. And he goes, okay, well, I, mean, I want to meet this guy. And then he like wanted to hire him on as the guitarist and singer because he sang. Uh, but he's like, uh, look, I'm only going to join your band if I could bring my girlfriend, Stevie Nicks. And he's like, nope. And he goes, all right, see you later. And he goes, all right, okay, okay, okay. You could bring her, you could bring this, whoever this chick is, and and she could join the band too. And <laughs> and then and then she walks in and, and blows the doors off. <laughs> yeah, so like, I mean, so with Lindsay, you have like, you have like huge songs, like, you know, you could go your own way and Monday morning and Big Love and Secondhand News. But then, you know, with Stevie Nicks, she had even right. bigger songs. Rhiannon yeah. and Dreams, Gold Dust Woman, Sarah, Gypsy, blah, 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 blah. The list goes on and on. So huge, 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 huge addition by bringing those two on. So, yeah. All right, next band are the prog rock legends Genesis, formed in Surrey, England, 1967. Originally fronted by the legendary Peter Gabriel. Yeah. Known for his wild stage antics and his theatrical showmanship. Uh, kind of a, if you guys have seen old <laughs> footage of this, it's just bizarre, man. Like it, you're like watching this going, what is going on up there? But, uh, they're big, they're a big band for live concerts back in the day. Cause they put on all that weird <laughs> stage performance stuff. But yeah, Gabriel had the uh, big songs like the carpet crawlers, supper's ready. And I know what I like in your wardrobe, but Peter Gabriel left to go do a solo career and the band scrambled to find a replacement singer. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if you guys know the story. It's kind of funny. Like they, uh, they, they were just trying out all these different singers and they're like, dude, none of these guys are working, man. And then like Phil Collins, who was the drummer is like, you know what? Let me give it a shot. And it was like, dude, rest is history, man. Rest is history. I was wondering, cause when I looked at the photo for like, just doing a little bit of homework, I saw Peter Gabriel and Phil Collins in the same photo. So I figured Phil must've been the drummer before. Yeah. I didn't add him. That's you answer my question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Phil Collins they went in a different direction, kind of like, you know, a lot of these groups do where it's kind of like they're doing one thing. And then it's like, if you have like one song, that's like a big hit and you get all this money. I mean, Hey, what's the old saying? Money talks, right? So, you know, they had like huge songs like misunderstanding. That's all invisible touch land of confusion. I can't dance. Huge songs, huge songs, you know, uh, Lee, what's your favorite song with Phil Collins? Oh God. Uh, I'm actually no expert on these guys at all, but I mean, I've, I've only recently come to, sort of phil collins as like i didn't like any of this when i was a when yeah. i was a kid i didn't i didn't like genesis i didn't like phil collins i didn't like any of it i thought it was really terrible very poppy uh, very poppy yeah, like and just pop rock yeah, yeah and then i and then i start kind of listening to it really recently honestly and uh i just start listening to the lyrics and i realize holy shit these guys are actually onto something it was something really cool um so for me i mean to sort of the Genesis question. I didn't listen to Genesis at all. Uh, the only Genesis I knew, I yeah. mean, I knew Peter Gabriel led Genesis for a while, but the only Genesis I know is Phil Collins. And, you know, when, when they start getting into uh, kind of the eighties is when, I mean, I guess 80 late eighties yeah, is when, you know, no jacket required or whatever. And I think that's, yeah. I think that's entry level Phil Collins. I think that's why I'm kind of into that. Yeah. Um, well, and he was talk about, being on an insane role. That guy was nuts. He was going, he was going back and forth between his solo career and Genesis. He might've been the most recognizable guy besides, you know, Michael Jackson and Madonna back then. I mean, like he was all over the place, all over the place. He was at live aid and just all over MTV. Just, he was all over the place. And that's part of the reason that he 
people got, you know, Phil Collins burnout. Like we were Ben Affleck? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Good good analogy. Yeah. Exactly. And, and maybe maybe 30 years from now, I'll look back on Ben Affleck's movies and appreciate him the way I appreciate Phil Collins now, but I don't think Not so. Not likely. Not likely. Yeah. Except for The Town. That movie. We lost the bet. That's all I'm saying. I did. Well, yeah. the, well, the town was good, and and like he did when he had, he had a string of like movies that was like three in a row that he did was like really good. Um, yeah, he's he's getting good as a director. Yeah. He just needs to to go away for a whole bunch of other reasons. Anyway, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go down that path. All right. I remember Genesis from the the one video. Like I didn't really, I knew Phil Collins because he was huge at the solo, like you were saying. I remember asking my dad going what the hell is he doing in this band? Like he formed a new band. My dad's like, no, Genesis has been around yeah. forever. I'm like, what is the planet of confusion with all the cool like puppets yeah. on it? Yeah. That's what I remember. I'm like, there's another band called Genesis. And then <laughs> they had a bunch of songs that I thought were just Phil Collins songs, right. not realizing they were Genesis songs. I'm like, oh, I've heard this. Well, famously, my buddy Jordan was like, you know what? I only like Phil Collins solo. And I go, you know, he's the lead singer and writes the lyrics to Genesis songs too, right? Right, so goes, it's kind of a solo a- effort but with the band. <laughs> and I'm like, I bet you I could play like a Genesis song back to back with a Phil Collins song. You'd never know. You'd never know the difference. So it's just kind of funny. I, I would he, be tricked. I think he used drum machines more in his solo stuff, uh, which is which is an odd choice for yeah, a drummer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not but, easy to do both, man. But you guys, you guys <laughs> have to respect those guys that can drum and sing and stuff. Like it's crazy. Well, I guess anybody I, that could do anything. I gotta like respect sing. a drummer anyway, because like. As a as a marginally mediocre guitar player, uh, not even good. Trying to keep one sort of uh, rhythm is hard enough. Those guys will have four different things going at four at, at the same time. Right. I mean, like each one of their limbs will be doing something completely different. It's incredible. Uh, agree. And then add singing on that. Holy shit. Yeah. Okay. How about the band Halloween? <laughs> where's where's the cricket chirping sound? <laughs> that was a real band, Josh. You're not just making that up. You want the stats? They uh, they formed in West Germany in 1984. No, no, we don't need to talk about Halloween. <laughs> West Germany? What the? <laughs> what are we doing? All right. All right. So, moving on. West Germany? The- before the Christmas <laughs> built the wall or what? <laughs> All, All right. right. Sorry. About- moving on. We have the band In Excess, formed in Sydney, yeah. Australia, 1977. Frontman. Michael Hutchins. The band had some pretty big hits back in the 80s and 90s with songs like New Sensation and Need You Tonight. And uh, Ethan, Never Tear Us Apart. I won't, buddy. I won't. Suicide Blonde and What You Need. And, uh, you know, one of, one of Rock's great front men. What do you guys think of NXS? I loved them. And I wasn't into poppy stuff. But, man, yeah. this stuff just, like, I, I just couldn't deny it. Like, it caught me. And I was just like, wow. And he was like, he had a presence. Like, yes. Get me wrong, I'm straight, but I'm just like, that'd be like, all right, if I was a chick. Well, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah well, because the guy, so he kind of looked like Jim Morrison. He had that yeah. aura of Jim Morrison, and he, and he sang kind of like Mick Jagger, but the band, like, almost like a dancey rock kind of thing. It was like a weird kind of deal, but it was like, it all worked. So it was, uh, it was, it was interesting. They had their own niche, right? Like, there was nothing, yeah. well, it didn't sound like anything else at that time. No, it was, it was interesting. Yeah. So do you guys remember when he died? Yes, and I remember yeah. it was, wasn't it from like auto erotic yeah. asphyxiation? <laughs> Thank you for giving me the technical term. Yeah. You wouldn't know that. So, you know. Know, so what's funny is uh, they later determined that it had been more about the, because I've seen documentaries on this and they were talking about what was actually going on during that period. And it was like some kind of deal where like he was dating some girl. Uh, I think it was, uh, you know, you remember that Bob Geldof guy, the guy that did uh, Live Aid and he was also in the band, the Boomtown Rats. I remember the name. Anyway, he was he was the guy that basically he got the whole Band Aid and uh, Live Aid stuff together. Anyway, he had a kid with uh, the girl he was dating, and, they, and he was like really like upset that he couldn't uh, have the kids come visit him or something like that. And he was all depressed on drugs and alcohol and uh, and hung himself. So yeah, I mean, I wasn't there. I have no idea. Maybe they're just trying to. Uh, maybe it's kind of like you know the hamster kind of deal with uh, what's his name. They're uh, just trying to. Yeah, and that's all I remember about like it. Don't, like I, I'm sad I even said that because I have no goddamn idea. That's all I remember them sure. talking about when he died. But yeah, these rumors are hilarious, and they're you know not so hilarious if you're the sister or something. Yeah, right. the band. Anyway, uh, so in 2005, CBS and the remaining band members of In Excess decided to have a talent show to replace Michael Hutchins. 
called Rockstar in Excess. Anybody remember this? No. No. <laughs> For good reason. Look at his name, JD Fortune. That's just the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so they name. they recorded an album with that guy, and bet it was awesome. You know what? There's actually a couple songs on there that were not bad, but a lot yeah. of that has to do with there's a guy in the group that you know pretty much writes all the songs. Like he's the genius, you know. But you know he's kind of like the dorky guy that doesn't look cool on you know screen or whatever. So. Uh, they need a cool front man. So uh, they got this guy who, you know, good looking kid, but the hits, and I'm using hits in like the parentheses, were uh, Pretty Vegas and Afterglow, I think were the songs off that album. And then uh, and then they tried to tour and he uh, had a massive Coke problem and they met him at the airport, shook his hand. They're like, well, see you later, buddy. Have a nice time. Have a nice life. <laughs> so that was NXS. So wow. yeah, it, I mean, in my mind, I wasn't a huge NXS fan, but NXS died in 1997 yeah. yeah as far as i'm concerned if they want to keep playing the songs of the replacement singer fine it's just like allison chains <laughs> Great. all right so here's a big one ethan uh, i knew it i'm so excited heavy metal legends iron, iron maiden formed in east london in 1975 steve harris said they went through a few singers before settling on paul diano in yeah. 1978 there's usually a few things that will get a lead singer replaced. And those would be, you know, the guy leaves to pursue a solo career. Uh, they get fired for drugs and alcohol, or they just flat out die. And in this case, Deanna was a severe cokehead. <laughs> so uh, they cut ties with him. So Ethan, what do you, uh, oh this is God. your baby right here, man. So, so Thanks, uh, go ahead, buddy. So the first two albums, uh, Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden, the first studio, like true studio release, even though they'd been a band for a while, I think kind of slumming it through the bars and such. And then uh, Killers were the two albums that Paul Diano was the lead singer. And there's some great songs on there because Steve Harris is the musical genius once yeah. again. Um, unbelievable bass guitarist, looks unbelievable in spandex, joking. Um, <laughs> but they, yeah, Paul Diano, with, they get him out of there and arguably once again here's a band where they it's like bruce dickinson is iron Maid. i mean steve yeah. harris is right but in terms of the front man here's this guy that's a world-class fencer who can fly the jumbo jet that takes them around the world because he's a pilot he's it's just crazy. like jack of all trades amazing kind of operatic singer that's definitely kind of that 80s quintessential sure. kind of hard you know metal rock voice uh somewhere just in between maybe the butt rock and the heavy metal but you're talking about a well-educated band that wrote songs about classical poetry, uh, historical events. I mean, it was just, I feel like I got an education in, and probably why I'm a social studies teacher is because of my fandom of Iron Maiden, because I keep going and going, what the heck is this song about? And there was no Google back then. So I just bugged my mom who was an English major, my dad who was a history major, and they knew about the roots of every song and would kind of educate me. And it was That's just awesome. It was incredible. And this, he was such an unbelievable singer. I mean, definitely kind of acquired taste. Like you have to love the eighties, butt rock cheese kind of metal style. Yeah. But well, Unbelievable, you, Ethan. You had that giant poster hanging oh, up, know. which is one of the most amazing posters I've still seen ever to this day. Where did you find that thing? That giant poster. What, what album was that off of? A uh, Power yeah. Slave or? Well, there's a power. No. I think the one that I had was for the live one after Power Slave, which is live after death with Eddie busting out of the ground like a like no. a lightning. No, 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 no. It was the 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 uh, pyramids. Uh, the that would be power slave. Okay. But I thought I had that regular sized. I, I don't know. I just remember staring at that. I was like, how did he get that? Po it was, it's amazing. Have, I'm sitting in my classroom here and I still have Iron Maiden, the trooper poster from my bedroom in 1986. <laughs> it's like laminated on my wall just to show my roots. That is awesome. Do you still yeah, have yeah. any of the That's old uh, Kelly Bundy posters up? Uh, uh, unfortunately, no. Those uh, they found <laughs> upon having in my classroom, but uh, <laughs> that's a dang shame. Yeah, it's Kelly Bundy. Good call, buddy. Yeah, well, that's Pamela awesome. Anderson, too, or... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My room was pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Shrine to adolescent hood, if you would. No, nah, but Bruce Bruce Dickinson, like it's it's a clear like it's one of those things where where you see the old guy who's decent, he's good. I mean, but it, like you said, it's the music is amazing. Uh, yeah. But then when you see Bruce Dickinson, it's it's just yeah. lights out. I mean, I mean it's, remember Bruce left Iron Maiden in like gosh, I want to say like late nineties, early two thousands, and he did his own thing, and it was so amazing. Like I thought wow. it was Iron Maiden when Iron Maiden was trying to make music. They tried one album with a different singer, and it did not go well. And more fans were flocking to to Bruce because he also picked up Adrian Smith, who's one oh, of the great. guitarists. Yeah. I'm out here. Sorry, I'm going too far. No, but, no, that's awesome. Yeah, I love it. I love so, it. And he came back, and since then they've just been still like uh, turning out albums. I mean, they're not they're not as amazing to me as the old stuff, but man, they still sell them out. And, oh, they're it's tour incredible. 
Did you watch the uh, documentary about Iron Maiden? <laughs> Yeah, I've got, I've got the one on Blu-ray, the Flight 666. Yep, about that's the one. Yeah, I saw that on, I don't know if it was Netflix or whatever I saw, but it was awesome. Where they flew around to like to countries that had never had a concert before and brought everything, <laughs> like to Costa Rica. And you're seeing people line up for weeks. So I'm just cool. like, how? And like, not just because it's the first concert, like they legit Iron Maiden fans. I'm like, yeah. how does Iron Maiden well, translate to every country on it? It's just crazy. It is funny because like, you know, I see these concerts that are not here in the States. You You think that, for some reason, you know, just growing up, uh, you know, American, you think that, you know, hey, there's a lot of metalheads in uh, in the United States. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. You, you see, like you yeah. see like Brazil, you see these like uh, these, these Germany, Germany, like the, you, there are huge, like 100,000 people. You're like, what is going on? Oh, my God. There are so many huge like concerts all over the world. It's crazy. So. It's wild, metal man. Festivals are all overseas, right? It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. It's it's cool to see though, man. You're like, there's some no of the lawyers video. there. You can have those concerts. Yeah. <laughs> well played, Lee. Well played. All right. Okay. So moving on. Next on the list is a band called Jefferson Starship. Yeah. One of Lee's favorites. Mm. I just heard crickets again. All right. Uh, so originally formed in San Francisco in 1965 as the Jefferson Airplane. Then half the uh, members went on to form Jefferson Starship in 1974. The lead singers of this band were Marty Balin and Grace Slick. Yeah. Grace Slick. They had some pretty big hits uh, with Marty Balin singing Miracles and Count on Me. Big, uh, you know, kind of like soft rock kind of songs there, you know. And then Marty Balin went on to do uh, solo. Uh, in 78, they replaced him with Mickey Thomas. Is anybody here familiar with Mickey Thomas? Is he like in any of the Starship songs that were popular in the 80s? Yes. He's, yes, He'll but that came later. Rock and roll and- yep. Uh, yep. That came later. But so Mickey Thomas, he stepped in and he did the vocals in 1979 off whatever album that was. But they had this uh, song uh, called Jane. And this guy, you guys want to talk about some pipes. Insane vocal range, right? Uh, he's the guy that did that song, Fooled Around and Fell in Love, Elvin Bishop. That is like oh, a yeah. one-hit wonder song, you know? He he did that song like a few years before that. And then uh, he went on to join uh, Jefferson Starship. But anyway, like Ethan said, they went on to form Starship after that. <laughs> and they had an even bigger success with uh, We Built the City, Sarah, and uh, Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now from uh, Mannequin. <laughs> the, the only song I know by them is We Built This City, which I think is roundly criticized as their worst song ever. And it's the only one I know or like. You don't know Sarah? Sarah! You don't oh, know. yeah, that's a horrible oh, yeah. song. <laughs> that's horrible, but I did it as my ringtone when my wife called. Oh, that's awesome. That's <laughs> Appropriate. Awesome. No, but the song Jane is actually uh, probably my favorite song by them. And uh, I think I put that on the playlist, so check that out. Anyway. White Rabbit, man. I know that's way older oh, stuff. Oh, yeah, but- that's uh, Jefferson Airplane. That's yeah. Hot. Yeah. yeah. And somebody to love. Don't you yeah. want some? Yeah. All right. So here's another interesting one. Little known band uh, by the name of uh, Journey, formed in 1973 out of San Francisco. So everyone is familiar with the heyday of this band with Steve Perry on vocals. But have you guys ever heard of the original singer, Greg Raleigh? Don't know that I have. So no. this is actually really, really interesting. Um, He's actually the vocalist and co-founder for both Journey and Santana. Whoa. So he's the one that belted out the, you know, because Santana was the guitarist. He would kind of like sing, you know, the back of vocals, kind of like, you know, or sing over the, the vocals, you know. But he's the one that sang all the classics like Black Magic Woman, Oyo Kamo Va, No One to Depend On, Evil Ways. Like he, he was the voice of Santana. And so this guy was no schlub, right? And he went on to form Journey. Wow. So he had some mild success, you know, with Journey. Because they had a minor hit, like, to play some music or nothing really huge. Then they had this other guy who came in and, like, did some songs with them on some of their live sets. His name was uh, Robert Fleischman in 1977. There's some, actually, uh, there's, like, a demo recording of him doing Wheel in the Sky. And it's not bad. You're, like, you're listening to it, you're like, this guy's pretty good, right? And then you hear Steve Perry. And you're like, okay, whoa, okay, I, I get it. So that's when they discovered the vocal freak of Steve Perry uh, in 1978. And that proved to be a pretty nice decision for them because they went on to be some of the biggest stars in the, on the planet. Wheel in the Sky, Don't Stop Believing, Open Arms, Faithfully, and the least favorite, Lights. Lee, what do you think about Journey? 
uh, the only journey I know is with Steve Perry. So like, it's it's really cool to learn about this this other guy that led the band and started Santana. It's right. cool to, to see that. But yeah, I mean, that's sort of the thing. Like when Stevie Nicks walked in the door and started singing, I'm sure they had the same thing. Like, hey, yeah. you know, okay, this this guy isn't bad. And then Steve Perry walks on, the mics go hot, and they just go, oh shit. <laughs> like next level. They, you know, right. I mean, that's right. the only journey I know is Steve Perry, and, and so he's uh, to me it's sort of fits into that thing where it's like we we would need to define what a replacement singer is for a band sure sure because if they had a shitty singer nobody really heard of them and then they get a good singer and everybody hears about them that's something different so yeah but yeah journey is steve perry i yeah agreed agreed ethan you have anything to say about journey no it's i mean <clears throat> i pretty much echo lee's sentiment there it's like i didn't know that other stuff that's really cool yeah and isn't that crazy that guy was no slouch but Man, Journey is Steve Perry in so yeah. many ways. I mean, yeah. All right. So the next band on the list is Judas Priest, yeah. formed in Birmingham, England in 1969. Lead singer Rob Halford became the lead singer in 1974. Uh, lots of hard rock classics, like uh, You've Got Another Thing Coming, Breaking the Law, and my personal favorite, Living After Midnight. But how about you guys? Are you guys fans of The Priest? This is all Ethan. <laughs> I definitely respected them. Like, you know, yeah. like Rob Halford's unreal. He had a solo album after he left that was really good too. Uh, maybe a project called Fight, I think it was called. But like, he was to be honest, this is exactly what Lee was talking about before. Like they got a replacement and though he sounded like they did a good job finding a guy that sounded kind of like Rob Halford. It was literally just so they could continue to make money. I don't know right. that they had any real commercial success or big hits after place the singer it was just an excuse to keep touring and make money yeah halford left in 1991 and the band eventually brought on a guy named tim ripper owens in 1996 apparently they found him uh from a judas priest cover band which yeah that's what I, I, recall. I know that this is fascinating or at least i thought it was a lot of bands are kind of doing that now where you know it kind of makes sense they already know the songs you know they and if they they can hear them you know, doing the songs well, it's like, well... Uh, yeah, why would you hold auditions anymore if you can just go to YouTube? Right, right. Like, I think it was Sting. He uh, he literally took his whole backing band that was a touring... They were just a cover band of, of the police or something like that. And he's like, I'll take you guys for my backup. I'm like, what? Wow. So all you YouTubers out there, take note. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no so, uh, yeah, Halford came out as gay in 1998... And I don't know if you guys remember those interviews, but they were fantastic. Uh, I don't know what interview it was. I was trying to find it the other day, but uh, he was like, I was dressing in s &M leather and walking around in like these just, you know, basically dressing right, like, up like he was in a gay New York nightclub. And, and he goes, and no one caught on. And he's yeah, like, nobody, yeah, yeah. you guys didn't know. <laughs> it's great. I was, like, uh, was dropping little gay breadcrumbs. Yeah, it was so funny, man. Like Eminem and the interview david spade was saying that like you know when he was when he was loving all these bands he goes and how was it not like so obvious to me that wham was gay or right, like right. uh queen he goes their yep. name is queen like how did this not across my mind it's yeah, like, yeah right. totally yeah adam carolla talks about that too he's like when he talks about the uh, the village people he's like <laughs> what's the old thing he goes yeah there's the uh, there's the indian there's the the cowboy the construction worker and then the uh, the, the the gay guy the gay guy <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving on, we have a little southern rock band known as Leonard Skinnerd, formed oh. in Jacksonville, Florida in 1969. So uh, the lead singer was Ronnie Van Zant, and this guy's more than the lead singer. He's pretty much the band. He wrote all the, the songs, and uh, you know they had all the classic rock hits, Freebird, Sweet Home Alabama, and What's Your Name, and all those good songs, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the... Uh, the band I had just released the album Street Survivors on October 17th, 1977. This is, I mean, it's a famous story. Everybody knows the, the story, but I didn't know it was this close to the release of that album. It was like literally three days after they released this album. Uh, they were flying out to start their tour. And I guess the plane ran out of fuel and it crashed into the woods of Mississippi. And uh, it killed Ronnie Van Zant, who was the singer. The guitarist, Steve Gaines, and Steve Gaines' sister, who was a backup singer. But the creepy thing about this story is the cover of the album. The picture was the band standing surrounded by fire and flames. And, 
and the record company immediately pulled the album from the shelves and re-released it with just a pure black background. So they took out all the flames and they just, they just re-released it like with them just standing in black. And uh, so I've seen that album, you know, of course now, um, but right after. Is that like the butcher cover? There's like 10 yeah, copies I, of it out in the world. I think there's more copies of that out than, than the butcher cover, but, but uh, it's still one of those covers that I don't know. I guess if you have the original printing of that album, uh, it'd probably be worth something, but right. But yeah, no, I, I placed them on here just because the replacement to the lead singer is his little brother, Johnny Van Zandt, which that's kind of cool. I think, I mean, like if you're gonna, if you're gonna attempt something like that, like, and, and it's funny cause like his brother, his brother's in 38 special. So like, it's a, it's like, a, they're all in bands. It's like crazy. Uh, but um, he became the lead singer of 1987. They didn't really do anything. They were just touring and stuff like that. I guess they were trying to release songs. But, you know, of course, when they did have a hit was after 9-11, which, you know, it's like, well, well hell yeah, Skinner. Hell yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a song called Red, White, and Blue. It came out in 2003. It was a minor hit. Uh, but anyway, yeah. So what do you guys think of uh, Leonard Skinner? I mean, I, I'm looking at their Wikipedia thing right here, and it literally says early years – peak 1973 to 1977 plane crash 1977 and then hiatus from (laughs) 77 to 87 yeah yeah so i think if you take a decade off before replacing the singer and you don't really write any new music you're you're not that's not a good replacement singer you take a decade it's not no the band died with with ronnie or johnny or whichever one died all right how about uh you want one that's even um like in the same kind of same kind of deal here yeah Next up is the punk rock band, The Misfits. Yeah. Uh, original lead singer was Glenn Danzig. You want to talk about some uh, steroids? Glenn Danzig. Uh, horror punk. Horror punk. Yeah. I like the names of their songs, by the way. It's probably the best part about this group is like the names of their songs, in my opinion. Night of the Living Dead, Halloween, Horror Business. Die, die, my darling. You know, like, you know, there's some classic like names to songs. But uh, Ethan, uh, you uh, you a fan of Danzig? You fan uh, of uh, when he separated and made his own music? I remember like a song or two that were kind of got mainstream. Mother. Honestly, I remember more of the Misfit songs because Metallica covered a bunch, and they yeah. were like really fun and goofy. Like, you know, I've got something to say. <laughs> I can't hear baby today, and it doesn't matter how much to me as long as it's dead and like green hell and like you said die die my darling right and right I covered that so that was my introduction to misfits and it just seemed like a, a t-shirt that looked cool that everybody loved to wear yeah. but when i asked them about do you know any songs they're like huh no. Whatever, you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they always said that it was like a skull or something like that or whatever yeah. that was yeah uh they disbanded in 1983 so they started in uh formed in new jersey in 1977 uh, disbanded in 1983. Danzig went solo. And then they reformed in 1995. What do you think about that, Lee? It's not the same. It's the same <laughs> shit we're talking about. And that was uh, uh, Michael Graves was the uh, was the new lead singer. But the only thing they kept going was the cool list of songs. They had a song called Scream. They had a song called Dig Up Her Bones. <laughs> uh, Psycho in the Wax Museum. And Land of the Dead. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Again, I'm leaning on Wikipedia here to help me because I'm not a big Misfits uh, expert, but it says under the track listing for uh, their Misfits album, all tracks are written by Glenn Danzig except <laughs> where noted. <laughs> so if you just blanket say they're just all written by Glenn Danzig unless yeah. we tell you otherwise, <laughs> then whoever you plug into that <laughs> microphone after him doesn't doesn't work. All right. All right. So we're moving on. We're moving on. How about the rock band known as the Moody Blues? They're formed in Birmingham, England in 1964. This is interesting. The original lead singer of the Moody Blues was Denny Lane. Have you guys ever heard of Denny Lane? Crickets. Mm-hmm. Crickets. Denny yeah. Lane was in the band Wings with Paul McCartney, and they lasted throughout the 1970s. And the, the hit that they had with Denny Lane as the lead singer was a song called Go Now. A very oldies kind of song. And uh, it was like from 1964 or something like that. Anyway, Lane quit in 66 and was replaced by Justin Hayward. And the success was pretty immediate and big. They had songs like Nights in White Satin, Tuesday Afternoon, 
Ride My Seesaw. I'm just a singer in a rock and roll band. Anybody know these songs? Um, yeah, so they, they were huge. They were huge. They're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame now. But that that was a huge, huge replacement because that guy, I mean, they had, I think they had like uh, that song Go Now, which is a which is a pretty big hit. And then it's like, um, anybody have any other, uh, <clears throat> anybody have any songs? You, you're definitely the expert on these guys. I Like, I didn't listen to, uh, to uh, Moody Blues at all. So, but I mean, it sounds like it, he was one of the dudes that replaced uh, with something more to add i mean you're yeah. you're the expert so i'll kind of let you well you know they're that. basically they they're heavily played on classic rock you know like nights and watch oh they're right yeah for sure you know like huge huge songs but yeah no i mean like that's one of those replacement singers where you know that guy's not like a very known like guy i mean as far as like you know justin hayward sounds like you know some guy we went to high school with or something like that but you know his impact in the band was massive like i mean he took over that band essentially and for the better so, so would you say he's the Steve Perry of Moody Blues? Oh, 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 oh look at this guy. So anyway. <laughs> All right, moving on. Or, or is Steve Perry the, uh, I, don't, I don't even remember the Moody Blues guy's name. Uh, Justin Hayward? See how? Yeah, is he the Justin Hayward of Journey? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's probably actually better. Uh, yeah, Steve, yeah. Steve Perry is the Justin Hayward of Journey. <laughs> okay. What's going on? I don't know what's going on anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. One of my favorite rock bands from the 80s, Motley Crue, formed yeah. in Los Angeles, California, 1981. Original frontman on the vocals, Vince Neil. And uh, they had songs like Shout at the Devil and Looks That Kill, Girls, Girls, Girls. Wow, first concert that... ever. First concert ever. Wow, that's a rad first concert. No yeah. kidding, dude. My that's amazing. took me to the Tacoma Dome to see White Snake. Opened for Motley Crue on the Girls, Girls, Girls tour in 1988. Whoa. And I was wow. a sixth grader and it was, I was not ready for what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> it was incredible. It was an amazing show. I think my sister brought me basically because I just, you know, I was a freak of nature. So I looked like I was a high school, even though I was in sixth grade. Sure. Just so guys were alone uh, at the concert. So <laughs> it worked. And I saw things I no young man should ever see, and it changed me forever. Tommy Lee just spinning around there, that drum set that spins like in the, the video Wild Side. Oh, it's so awesome. Oh, it was so amazing. That whole show was just like, like that was that formed immediately my love for live music. Oh, that that is a- so awesome, man. That is so great. And Lee, Lee used to blast the song uh, Kickstart My Heart when we'd be driving around and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. So good. Yeah, I mean, it's. Molly, I mean, and I'm going to jump right ahead of this. Whoever followed him, John Karabi or whatever, whoever followed Vince Neil wasn't, it doesn't, it doesn't count. count. Yeah. It doesn't count. It's so, not Vince. Vince well, Neil is the lead singer of Molly. Curry. I used to have this discussion with Chuck and Chuck loved John Karabi. Uh, but, but I was like, I don't get it, man. Like I remember, so that album, that Motley, I think it was just called Motley Crew. It came out in like 1994. We were in high school. It was like, I don't know if it was like March or something or February. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, it came out when we were in high school and I was like, really? And I go, and it has a new lead singer. Who wants to hear that shit? Like, I was like very against it. I, I remember even back then I was like, no, I'm not listening to this. And I, even when I heard it, I was like, this sucks. Like hooligans holiday. What? But it's funny. Cause, uh, what's his name? The, uh, guitarist Mick Mars. He said it's actually his favorite Motley Crue album. And I'm like, really? Huh? Maybe because it's maybe because, writing or something. Maybe because it's the hardest or something. You know what I mean? Like I don't know. I, I have no. Well, idea. those guys were such a uh, just a mix of of booze fueled, drug fueled, like yeah, they're probably clean, very clean. Uh, I think one. probably a lot of these guys are looking back on that and just say, oh no, that was that was the best because they weren't out of their minds. Yeah, I mean, maybe, like, maybe I think that's, that's one that they remember. <laughs> they actually yeah, remember they that remember one? it exactly. Yeah, right. there you go. Did you guys ever watch the uh, the Dirt on Netflix? The uh, the movie? Oh yeah, a couple times. That's a great. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. You know, they don't make movies like that. They, I, they... <laughs> There's a lot of stuff to. going on in that movie, man. <laughs> I wanted to start it, and I think we got a few minutes in, and Sarah just goes, "Let's watch something else." Oh, like, dude, watch oh. that. Just make sure that Sarah's not in the room. Should I have Riker? Should Riker? Should this be an education for Riker? How old's Riker now? <laughs> I mean, it, it can't 75. be worse than sending him to an actual Motley Crue concert. Like I think it's dad, about time. Right? I think it's about time to introduce him to some uh, Motley Crue. And uh, yeah. Yeah. okay, yeah. I'll yep. watch the dirt. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's worth we're... watching. It's good. <laughs> it's awesome, All man. Right. All right. So next up, we have the heavy metal band Pantera, formed in Gosh. Arlington, Texas in 1981. I'm so, telling you, this one threw yeah. me through a loop when I saw that on there, because I'm like, wait a minute. Like, I had heard rumors that they were 
kind of like, and I didn't realize it was a real band. They actually had albums as this glam rock band. Like this blew me away. Yeah, the main yeah, singer. I, I had no idea yeah. there was anybody other than Phil Anselmo. You know what's funny is I threw on the song like Hot and Heavy from 1985 just to showcase like how this sounded. And I was like, this isn't wow. horrible. I mean, it's like, you know, it sounds like, you know, just like kind of like the, the hair metal bands of the day. Yeah. Uh, but talk about a different wow. band. You You want to talk about a massive shift in direction. Listen to that song that I put on that playlist and then listen to the song after it. <laughs> and it's, it's wild that it's the same band. It's, it's what song crazy. Did you put for the, for Phil. I think I put uh Cowboys from hell. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a good choice. So what, yeah, that album too, you can almost see still some of the roots of the glam rock stuff. Like it wasn't surprising when you really do the homework. Like I remember, cause obviously this is one of the bands I absolutely loved and saw live probably more than any band, but maybe Metallica. I, think yeah. I saw them like six times live or something. That's wow. so rad. Um, and just unbelievable live show. Uh, but when, when you think about, I had this video, this like VHS called like Vulgar Tour, and they kind of had like all this behind the scene video crap. They're hanging out with Skid Row and Sebastian Bach. And I'm like, <laughs> just laughing, going like, why are they hanging out with Skid Row? Like, right. this is not metal in my mind, right? Yeah. Um, and then they would show Dimebag, and Dimebag Daryl was such a huge like Kiss fan, like Ace oh, Frehley. Yeah like his hero yeah and so i started to see i'm like it makes sense when i really started to piece together all the evidence i had in my head of just being a fan of the band for so long but well yeah uh, when, and even didn't famously didn't he get buried in a kiss casket and wearing yeah. or didn't he have the van halen guitar like <laughs> within the kiss casket or something like that something crazy like that yeah just the shows it's like what a fan he was of that yeah. music i mean like we all are nostal nostalgic for the yep. things we grew up with right yeah and uh daryl definitely loved that kind of music and obviously his tragic end and it was so sad, but uh, just Ethan, an unbelievable artist. You saw them how many times? Six times. Six times. Uh, and Lee, did I see them with you or was I with my brother? I think no, was... I never saw him. I never oh, okay. Saw him I was with my brother I and I just remember uh, at that concert, it was cool. I, I always remember this. Um, this guy was like in this wheelchair and, and the uh, uh, the lead singer of Phil Ensemble goes, uh, hey, hey, get that motherfucker up here. And like, literally you see this wheelchair rise up in the middle of the audience. And like, the, he's like surfing. Like the people are like bringing this wheelchair and it's like, surf, it's going like on a wave up to the stage. And then he goes up to the stage and then he starts singing with him. And I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> you mentioned that on the pod when you had Andy on. And I was thinking like, it was awesome. Was that at the Mercer Arena? Because yes. I swear I remember that. I was at that show. Yes, probably, John. yes. Our, that is so awesome, dude. I was probably there with Goodman and a bunch of those knuckleheads throwing blows. And Yeah, because I, I remember I had to, uh, I got tickets to that show. And remember, I had always like, I would always tell people, because I was working at KISW, and I and I go, hey, uh, and it would always be last minute. I'm like, oh, shit, we, got, we have tickets now. So I'd be like, you know, hey, Andy. Uh, you want tickets to Pantera? And he goes, why are you kidding? Yeah. And I'm like, well, you got to get down here. Uh, blah, blah. He goes, he's like, I'm, I'm literally already on my way. I'm already, I'm like, okay. All right. All right. So like, uh, yeah. So those times where I get like tickets, I remember Lee like drove across the mountains one time to see Chris Cornell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. That was fun. Well, that had to be like 99 or 2000. Wasn't it right around that? Like, yeah. Yep. Right around that, that time. I, that was the show that, okay. So I brought Marlo and Robbie with me to that one. Okay. And so a couple of central Washington football players, mm -hmm. see one big cat Marlo, as soon as we get there, cause we had so much snow and so many issues and Lee, this is where Robbie formed his crazy story about only the mule deer that pissed turpentine on old highway 10, you know, Robbie with his <laughs> strange bizarre. We finally make it there. We missed the whole opening act of whoever was opening for Pantera that time. Marlo rips his shirt like he's Superman or the Hulk off and just starts running out onto the floor, just throwing haymakers. And I'm thinking like somebody's going to die. I'm like, I'm going to have to go bail him out of prison. I slowly work my way snaking and serpentining up to the front because I loved watching them play, especially Dimebag. I had to try to get in front of Dimebag every time and just watch him play. Um, they play some like backless B song off of uh, the great Southern trend kill, a song called, uh, oh gosh dang it, I'm trying to think of it right now, War Nerve. And I know War Nerve, well, I'm screaming word for word everywhere at Phil. <laughs> Phil pulls me up half like on the guard rail gives me the microphone and I got to sing walk That's with awesome, Phil dude. at that same concert. That, that is they so amazing. <laughs> you probably had no idea that was me up there because it was just a blood fest up no, there. Cause I think I kept trying to choke me and Marlo literally pulled him by the hair and elbowed him into the ground. I never saw him. He just disappeared and mushed into the ground. Marlo's like, heck yeah, he's stupid. I'm like, 
Dude, what I the hell just happened. I was not strong enough to ever go. I went up there once with you, and I, I was getting my ribs crushed. But you were strong yeah. enough to, you push were back. big enough to like push back on that on those rails. And I'm like, I'm I can't I can't go up there, man. Yeah. I can't do that. I'll I'll st- sit back here and I'll watch Ethan uh, enjoy himself in front of the band and everything like that. But I ain't, I ain't doing that shit. <laughs> six foot, yeah, you know, you know, over six foot helps too, so that you can actually see above and not smell everybody's bo entirely. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, no, just they're, they were unreal. And I, yeah. the fact that they even had a singer before that, right. I saw there's like interviews posted on YouTube with them. And wow. That's wild. To me just to even know that that was even part of their history. To that's be crazy, man. That's, that's awesome. Um, I also love the story of that. Have you guys seen, there's a, there's a story they did with the photographer of that album. What's the, with the one with, is it the one with walk on it? The one with the guys getting punched in the face? Yeah. yeah. Vulgar. They, oh, like they, they literally punched a dude in the face for that for that cover. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fucking amazing. That's about right. Those guys were so idiots, good. man. Watching so that good. video, I mean, they did the dumbest human tricks like I've ever seen. Like they were just, <laughs> but God bless them. All right, next one on the list is a band called Pink Floyd. Legendary. Pink Floyd, formed in London, England, in 1965. The original lead singer was a guy named Sid Barrett. And they started out very psychedelic 60s. And then in 1968, Barrett was actually fired for mental issues and excessive drug use. And the uh, the guy literally, literally went crazy. Like, uh, in the 60s? Drug use in the yeah. 60s? Really? Yeah, right, right. So then they brought on this singer-guitarist named David Gilmore in late 67. And the rest is pretty much history because that guy sang a lot of their biggest hits on some of the biggest albums of the seventies, dark side of the moon, wish you were here. And of course the wall. Uh, but yeah. What do you guys think of, uh, what do you guys think of Pink Floyd? I, I never really got into Pink Floyd. So I'm, I'm kind of, yeah. I mean, whatever for Pink Floyd, I'm no authority on them. <laughs> my dad loved them. This is one of the weird things that my dad used to make me listen to on top of Suzy Q on repeat 95 times <laughs> in the dark room. <laughs> Uh, but he loved his Pink Floyd. Like when I was eight or something, he made me watch The Wall, which no young man should see that either. Like I, this kind of explains why I'm so mentally ill. Um, <laughs> but I was just shocked going back and listening because I was like, I was just curious, like, really? They had a different guy? And when I was listening on Spotify to some of the tracks, I swear to you, Josh, it reminded me, I don't know if you've ever seen the Spinal Tap documentary, but when they try to go back and show the Spinal Tap's early days of yeah. all this weird music, they make, I'm like, this almost seems made up. Like, is this really, like, oh, it's you very bizarre. psychedelic to yeah. the max. Yeah, it it's, it's crazy. Yeah, there's a, uh, what's this song called? Lucifer Sam or something like that. And it's like really super catchy, but it's like, good Lord, what is this? And he, I guess he called his cat Lucifer or something like that. So he'd like sang the song about his cat or something like that. And I was like, wow, this is the guy that went crazy? No. Uh, yeah, so it's interesting. Very different band. If you want to listen to uh, some early Pink Floyd and see how different they became, uh, certainly check that one out. All right, next on the list is one of Billy Madison's favorite groups, Ario Speedwagon. Crickets again. Uh, formed in yeah, Champaign, no Illinois in 1967, Mike Murphy uh, was, well, he wasn't technically, I guess, their first lead singer, but he wasn't even their second lead singer. But he he's the first one to actually have a hit with the band uh, called Riding Out the Storm. He did three albums with them until the band brought back Kevin Cronin in 1976. You know, Kevin Cronin, he's like the guy that's there now. He's kind of like the the dorky, you know, like the dorky front man. But he had previously been in the band a few years before that. Kind of a weird background story about this. Uh, Yeah, so he was previously in the band, and then he left the band for like three albums and came back. And then it was a good decision to bring him back because they had some monster hits, Uh, you know, like Keep On Loving You and Roll With The Changes and Take It On The Run. And Lee's personal favorite, Can't Fight This Feeling. Mm. Yeah, oh yeah Thank we love that song and i'm like lee okay dude we, we just heard that song do we have to hear it again man actually that sounds like a song that maybe robbie would have been singing in the <laughs> shower with the beer <laughs> that would probably be true yes <laughs> oh it's amazing all right you know what's funny um one of the songs that i put on that playlist that everyone should check out is the song uh roll with the changes and it's a big uh classic rock hit right and it was off their big album in the 70s, uh, and it had a picture of a fish with a tool coming out of the mouth, and it was like, you could tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish. And uh, <laughs> stupid, I know. I, I always like that album cover. But anyway, check out the guitarist on that song. Dude, It that guy's like, 
He's like one of those guitarists that you're like, oh, this guy's in Ario Speedwagon. He can't be like, he can't be very good. You're like, dude, he's thrashing on that song, dude. He's like, and he's like playing like, you know, just, he's like one of those guitarists. Like I saw this video of Eddie Van Halen playing a song on uh, David Letterman. And someone commented, they're like, dude, he's not even, he's playing Panama and he's not even looking down at the guitar. It's crazy when people like can own a guitar and just play it like, like it's just nothing. It's, you know, whatever. And that was that guy. So right. I, was, I just thought that was interesting. I was like, geez, man, that guy's freaking good. I was like, I had to look him up and I was like, who is this guy? Jesus Christ. Uh, anyway, uh, next up is the band, The Small Faces. Anybody know who The Small Faces are? Sounds like a band that uh, Ethan's uh, dad would like. I know Rod Stewart, but I'd never heard of The Small Faces. Yeah, me either. Is The Small Faces different than The Faces? Kind of. So uh, the original band, Small Faces, was, was led by a guy named uh, Steve Marriott. And uh, he had the song Ichiku Park, which is a big hit. Uh, but he, he left to, uh, to join Humble Pie. You guys know who the guitarist of Humble Pie was? Negative Ghost Rider. Nope. A guy named uh, Peter Frampton. Was oh, in Humble wow. Pie. That guy. Yeah. Alive. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, Faces brought in uh, Ronnie Wood, who's now with the Stones. But he brought his buddy Rod Stewart to join the band. And they ended up having a, a few big songs before... Uh, Rod, uh, well, I guess he was he was going solo at the same time, uh, but he, uh, but in between, he was like, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll play with your band, and he had a couple big hits like "Stay with Me" and and the cover uh, "I Know I'm Losing You." Uh, what do you guys think about Rod Stewart? Um, uh, had a hot wife. Yep. Yeah, a couple hot wives. Yeah, but, I mean, clearly, <laughs> clearly a rock star. I mean, he was, you know, yeah. obviously. That guy, I don't know. I, I was never an fun back in the day. Anything Rod Stewart. Guy had a lot of fun back in the day. Yeah, young. that's what I remember. I remember a song for every young that my mom loved of his, and that was about all I know about Rod Stewart. Yeah, he uh, he one of those careers where he pissed off a lot of true rockers because he had a great rock voice and he was the actual like rock star back in the day. And then he kind of like you know started doing like soft rock, and then he started doing disco, and he did like new wave. And people were like, what the fuck? What do what are you doing, man? Like, what is probably this like shit? Drugs? Yeah, probably like drugs and uh, and you know, getting late. Yeah. <laughs> And the, the other rockers that couldn't get those things were just pissed. And so they were jealous, I'm yeah. sure. Well, you know, this exactly. famous album where, where he's like literally crossing over, it's called like Crossing the Atlantic, I think it's called, and where he's like going from, you know, England to, to the United States. And he's like, I'm going to go get me some of this uh, California action over here. So, yeah, oh, yeah, more power to him. Okay, so the next one here, it's a band called Survivor. Are you guys familiar with Survivor? The uh, bass player lives in my town. Whoa! Owns a music store here, Billy O. Billy O. Zello. Well, that makes sense Billy because... Billy O's Dynamite Music. That's awesome because they were formed in Chicago in 1978. And this one really is fascinating to me because much like ACDC, a lot of people don't know that they actually switched lead singers. He sounds pretty much just like the, the same guy, right? Uh, well, wait, when was Sylvester Stallone the singer? Uh, 1982. <laughs> okay, yeah. So that's what I always thought. Yeah, yeah. So uh, famous hit song, Eye of the Tiger from Rocky III in 1982. But he ended up leaving the next year because he had throat problems. These damn throat problems. Man. And, well, drugs and, you know, dying and all this good stuff. But anyway. Uh, so <laughs> I'd rate dying above a throat problem <laughs> in the problems category, but okay. So uh, here's a quick trivia question for you. Did you know Dave Bickler, uh, the original lead singer of Survivor, he actually left, and I don't know what he did after that. I think he probably kicked around doing some other bands and stuff like that. But he ended up being the voice of the Bud Light campaign, Real American Heroes, or yes. later, Real Men of Genius. Real Men of Genius. The singing guy in that? Yeah, isn't that awesome? Yes. So his replacement has kind of like an equally kind of a cool story. Jimmy Jameson, he is the one that took over. And he had like another, he had, it's funny, they, they're like, apparently uh, Stallone liked the band because uh, they had uh, Burning Heart from Rocky Four, And he had the songs uh, High on You. I mean, I, you probably know him if you heard him. But here's a fun fact about Jameson is he was the guy that actually sang the theme song to Baywatch. <laughs> wow. I'm always It here. wasn't Hasselhoff? Yeah. <laughs> no. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So he's the guy that sang, uh. I would love to have that kind of claim to fame. Like if nobody knew my name right? ever, but like you just, you get into conversation with people, a few drinks in and you're like, yeah, I sang the theme song to Baywatch. 
That's yeah. it. Like the rest of your life, you're the guy that sings the theme song. Right, right. Life. Yeah. A lot That'd of be... fantasies made to that song. A lot of fantasies. Well, hopefully, yeah. hopefully he had a lot of those stories because now he's dead. So, oh, darn. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Well, look, if I die tomorrow, I didn't author anything <laughs> like the theme song to Baywatch. So, exactly. Exactly. Just give it so. time, Lee. I believe in you. You can do it. <laughs> Interesting. Could Baywatch even go on TV today, though? Oh, that's a good hmm. question. Good question. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think, I think so either. Baywatch, Baywatch is a, a uh, an time unacceptable capsule. objectification yeah. of women now. Yeah, could the uh, Playboy Mansion exist now? No. Yeah. No, God, no. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> God, he, he lived in the exact right period of time, didn't he? Yeah, you know, have never had the best life of yeah. anyone ever, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. We're going to uh, the Motown legends, The Temptations. Uh, yeah. The original lead singer... And the golden voice on those old records was a man by the name of David Ruffin. And they were formed in 1960 out of Detroit. Uh, he sang the songs, you know, like the, the early smash hits, My Girl and Ain't Too Proud to Beg and I Know I'm Losing You and Beauty is Only Skin Deep. Those classic songs, uh, Motown songs, oldies. Um, but drug use and constant arguing with management and fights with the band ended with him uh, being replaced by Dennis Edwards in 1968. So they still had big hits because they were part of that Motown machine, man. They just plop them right in and uh, had songs like Cloud Nine, I Can't Get Next to You, and Ball of Confusion. Papa Was a Rolling Stone and Shaky Ground. Uh, what do you guys think of The Temptations? Kind of out of my timeline. I mean, Yeah, it's, I, it's a little out of mine too, but it's at least the songs you mentioned with the first guy, I yeah. know all of those. The yeah. songs you mentioned with the second guy, I'm not sure I've heard those. Well, I mean, I may be if I heard them, but. Well, Ethan, it's funny you say that because my dad famously said back in 1998, they ain't nothing without roughing. <laughs> I love Lee Matlock. God true bless story. him. <laughs> true story. So anyway. A legend. Uh, okay. And all right, here we go. And fittingly, last but definitely not least, the monsters of rock themselves, the mighty Van Halen. Mm-hmm. Formed in Pasadena, California in 1974. Some say he was the ultimate frontman back in his day, David Lee Roth or Diamond Dave. What do you guys think of Diamond Dave in the David Lee Roth era of Van Halen? The only Van Halen that exists to me, Josh, and you know this. We've had many a talk about this over the years. <laughs> I am a big Diamond Dave. Like, if it isn't about drugs, sex, and rock and roll. <laughs> It's not Van Halen to me. And the Hagar is like a whole different band. It's like, and it's good. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, I, they got some catchy stuff, but it ain't Van Halen. Well, I, I, I heard David Lee Roth talk about that. And he's like, think of the songs that I did. I did like running with the devil and ain't talking about love and, mm-hmm. you know, ice cream man and uh, beautiful girls and everybody wants some. And, you know, all these songs that are like not necessarily love songs. And then you have the antithesis of that would be Sammy Hagar where it's like, you know, dreams and why can't this be love? And love <laughs> walks in and when it's love, you know, it's like, I, he makes a good point. Like, you know, and with they're more synthy and you know, they're they had technically bigger hits, I guess. Right. They technically I bigger guess. hits. I don't know. Yeah. But I'm with Ethan here. Like there's, I mean, Sammy Hagar is as good a replacement singer as you could get, but I think as much of that success has to be owed to, uh, Eddie and Alex and just how how monster that band was yeah. when he took over. I mean like the yeah just I, the power behind him propelled them and he he was a good front man. I mean it's sure. Sammy Hagar was good. True. Yeah he was good he was uh, great. And, solo. and so like you couldn't plug somebody shitty like Gary Sharon in there and have it work. <laughs> but yeah. but Sammy Hagar, you, you know, he was a rocker. Well, he was I, a red rocker. He could totally carry it. But yeah. I, I totally agree with Ethan. There's there's Van Halen and then there's Van Hagar. Right, yeah. right. I, I remember getting excited to see him on MTV back in the day, D- David Lee Roth, uh, because he was nuts, right? You like, you see him, you're like, okay, this guy's crazy. He always has hot chicks around him. He's always making these crazy, weird statements and rhymes and stuff. And you're like, I can't wait. Like They're like, wait, come up. We have David Lee Roth, so stick around. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be sticking around. This is going to be awesome. So like, I just remember always like, being excited when he'd be coming on because he was entertaining. I'm sure he wasn't fun to work with, but no, you know. he's, he's even in the movie, the dirt. You got to watch yeah, that. Ethan. Right. 
Well, I just was like, we were, we were watching, I don't know, some trailer for a movie called Nobody that looks awesome with like uh, the Bob Odenkirk guy that was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That great movie, Nobody coming out. And I'm like, oh my God, this is that song that David Lee Roth covered when he was doing his solo stuff. And yeah. I went back and pulled up the video for Justin Gigolo and all the Dave <laughs> TV and all the like, oh my Lord. He was just, he was so bigger than like, just larger yeah. than life and absolutely back crap crazy, man. He was nuts. It was and hilarious. I think hit the perfect time. I mean, like oh, yeah. late seventies, that rock, that band with that much power. And I mean, you could easily get blown off stage by Eddie Van Halen alone. And he owned it. I mean, Dave, I mean, he was maybe the best front man of a rock band of yeah. all time, as far as just charisma and talent and just being able to own a stage that was filled with giants. And it's, it's crazy when you, when you see a band that big, I, it's hard to explain how big they were. They were the biggest rock band in possibly the world. And then they broke up <laughs> like at the, at the right. peak of their popularity. You're like, wait a minute, they're, they're done. They're, they're like broken up. And like, and then you see all those, uh, you know, MTV things. It's like, you have no idea like if he was fired or if he quit or whatever and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's just a, that soap opera is, is part of what made that band and uh, like so interesting. <laughs> Over the years, you know, it's just, it's just a complete soap opera. Absolutely. Um, I mean, come on, really? <laughs> I, remember I mean, I, that, but that was the plug-in. That was the, we want to keep touring, keep making money. Uh, we can't get Dave uh, or Sammy. Let's just get somebody to roll around with us. I, He's the plug-in guy. I will never forget when Lee bought that album. <laughs> God, that was a shitty album. He bought, <laughs> Lee, no, Lee bought that. Check this out. I don't even know if I've ever told this before. I Lee, the story. Lee bought this album. He bought the new Gary Shimon. He's like, it's got to be good. You know, Extreme was a pretty good band. And then, you know. Well, and, and set the table, though. It was in a CD store where you were allowed to listen to the CDs first. <laughs> but I was such a big Van Halen fan. I was like, hey, it's going to be good. It's yeah. going to be great. It's yeah, fine. You, so he, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it, and it's fine. <laughs> he buys it, and he listens to it on the way over to my house. And he goes, hey, man, you want to take a road trip? And I go, uh, sure. And he goes, we're returning this fucking CD. And I go, wait, didn't you just buy this? And he goes, yeah, it's fucking terrible. And I go, oh, okay. And then he gets like half his money back. It was so bad that Lee would like just accept half of his money back. Or oh, yeah. I remember the guy's like, well, I can't give you your full <laughs> money back. Is there something wrong with it? And I was like, yeah, it's really shitty. <laughs> and he's like, well, but anything wrong with the disc? And I was like, not really. Oh, I don't God. think so. It's so great. And, and he goes, I can only give you. And it was like, you know, CDs were, you know, 11 bucks or something <laughs> at that point. And he's like, I can give you like 350 And I was like, done. <laughs> Fine. Should have taken it up to the pawn shops. Maybe might have gotten more cash right up at the pawn shop there. Yeah, and, uh, uh, yeah maybe, maybe. But I just wanted that out of my life. I just, yeah, if, if he had offered me, wow. you know, a high five, I'd have been like, great. There you go. All right. I, I just wanted to quickly point out before we start this, I did skip over a couple of them because I it was kind of in that same kind of realm that we were talking about, where like you know, gun, Guns and Roses, almost the entire band formed Velvet Revolver, which is essentially Guns and Roses without Axl Rose, but. Even though you know Slash Duff and Matt Sorum, uh, they they went on to well, do so. That's so that that's a good tie-in though for where I was going to go with this because from the stuff that we discussed, obviously I've I've got my choices. But if if the definition is that the band name had to stay the same, yeah, um, then then it can be sort of like you can trade out a bunch of band members and the lead singer, and it can still make this list. Uh, I had one that sort of popped into my head when you started mentioning this before we wrote anything down yeah but it but it doesn't count by that rationale because the band name changed gotcha and, okay. and i think it would be the the runaway winner honestly um it it's eddie vetter i mean he basically he replaced uh andrew wood in mother love bone and gotcha, added gotcha. mike mccready i mean like it's they changed right. band names but it was right. basically mother love bone is pearl jam with mike mccready and eddie vetter and he replaced him with nine months notice before they released, basically, it was it was basically a year from the time Eddie Vedder joined the band to the time Ten was a number one album. It's so crazy. And yeah, so that's the one that popped in my head. I was like, well, the best replacement singer in history was Eddie Vedder in my mind, but but it doesn't match because right. he, it was a different band. No, so, yeah, I mean, because if you're talking great, about that, that's a great then one. That's open the door to Chris yeah. Cornell in in Audio Slave. Sure, and, sure. And, yeah, that's so, another one that yeah. I kind of like. I was like, all right, it's a it's a new technically band, I guess. Right. So that's. So that's my my sort of outside the lines answer. But yeah. okay, okay, and then I I skipped like you know of course it's, some of these bands that just had a new lead singer like you know twenty five years later they, they, it's just not the same. They're not charting any new songs or anything like that. So Queen's out, uh, Stone Temple Pilots like with Chester Bennington. I like I guess he had a, like he did a song with them. Uh, but, yeah. But it's just news to me. It, <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so guys, let's get to our lists here. So first off, I just like to point out that 10 years ago, my list would have looked a lot different than my list does today. And the reason for this is I'm looking at this a lot differently. Uh, some, some of these bands were already you know pretty big. And the singer kind of, like we were talking about, kind of just slid in and continued on with the, the great band that they were. And uh, for me, with my selections, the singer was the magical key or the missing puzzle that the band needed just to uh, open it up and become legendary, become superstars. So that's kind of like what I was going with. I, and again, this yeah. is just my list. You guys decide, uh, however you guys do it, it could be different, whatever your ranking is. There's no rules. Let's start off with our runner-up. Let's do it. All right, so I, I, I've got a couple that are going to fall outside, and I don't know if I should bring them up now or, or as a as a postscript. Uh, from the list that we that we did, okay, uh, three of them stand out to me. Um, my runner up, the one that didn't make the top three, was was Mike Patton from Faith No More. I think he's he changed the band Faith No More in in a way that was. Good completely transformative and he was a massive talent uh he also kind of needs to make the list for me because he never got his due i mean that that's kind of counterintuitive to say the best lead singer is a guy you never heard of uh, yeah but no yeah because right. most people you say mike Patton, they have no idea who but you're every, talking about you know people so. know faith no more well i guess uh a lot of people don't even know faith no more but right right so it's <laughs> that's why it can't be near the top even though i wish it was like i want to advocate for mike Patton and for faith no more because they're better than what people remember gotcha but gotcha. i can't because there are some names the the top three on this are are they're simple okay i mean they're they, they make the list because they ought to be on it <laughs> okay well i might surprise you all right so ethan who is your runner-up uh my runner-up is honestly strange enough it's faith no more as well wow wow nice as, as a fan of faith no more and stuff like that it's kind of a similar th thought process to what lee was saying it's just like they're not well known enough but man like they're just a different band in the talent. So yeah, this, the talent he brought was game changing. Awesome. awesome. I like Ethan. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, okay. My runner up, it's a, it's a tie. I cheated. I know we're not supposed to have ties, but, uh, but I'm doing it. So it's your show. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can do whatever you damn want, buddy. All right. So my runner up selections are David Gilmore of Pink Floyd and Phil Collins of Genesis. Those are my two. Uh, Pink Floyd went on to become, they went on from, becoming a pretty good and interesting band to one of the biggest acts on the entire planet, certainly in the 1970s. And what can you say about Phil Collins? Not only uh, did he take over for one of the biggest front men of all time, Peter Gabriel, but he even surpassed his level of success and uh, ended up being one of the biggest icons in the entire 80s. So, uh, so Phil Collins and David Gilmore. So uh, that is my runner up. Lee, who is your uh, number three? We're getting into the top three now. Top three. Uh, it's, it's Van Hagar. It's Sammy Hagar. I think he, he deserves to be on the top three. He, you know, the band was the biggest band in the world. I, you can't step on that stage with that kind of pressure and hold your own unless you really have talent. And he did. I mean, like, he, cause everybody wants to Who hate the guy like that replaces David Lee Hagar. Rock. I mean, like Hagar's not one of those kind of guys that like people go, I fucking hate Sammy. Like who hates Sammy Hagar? Right, but the, but think about that for a second. Think about if your favorite band was Van Halen, right, and they kick David Lee Roth out, or he quits, or however it happened. What's your initial impression with whoever steps on stage next? You want to hate him. <laughs> well, that, that's and that's what happened back in the day. I mean, right, I, but but know. he still succeeded. So right. that's why I'm giving him sort of credit for being a guy that could withstand that storm because yeah. he stepped onto a stage with hostile bandmates yeah. even <laughs> and, and still ran with it and had a really, really great run with them. Oh, so he's he's my number three guy. Isn't his music better though, before he joined Van Halen too? Like, yes. yeah, but that might be because Eddie and Alex are pretty, they're bullies. They probably yeah. just said, you just stand over there and sing. <laughs> All right. Okay. And Ethan, who's your number three? Who is your number three, Ethan? Clearly, this is obviously I've got bias to my my lane here. So my answers are going to start to sound like I'm just some sort of like just metalhead that doesn't it's care. It's your about list, man. It's your list. <laughs> I know. And it's just because once again, because of what I've listened to, because I have to respect Van Hagar. Like, honestly, if there was honorable mentions that were probably right there, right around four, I was kicking around Pink Floyd. Uh, shout out to my dad. I was clicking around Fleetwood Mac because of Danny Marsh. She tried to brainwash me. Danny Marsh. Uh, but third would be third would be Pantera for me just because like the fact that they tried and had multiple I was like that's when I did my homework I don't know that they would have 
I just thought like, really? But I didn't realize yeah. they'd put out multiple albums right. and done the glam rock thing since like 84 prior to Cowboys Trail, which I, I think was 1990. Yeah. Yeah. So I almost had, I almost had them on my list, man. Like I, it was, it was right there, right there. Yeah. How significant they are to obviously that, like you said, there's the change in what metal music sounded like at that time. It was, they were instrumental in that. So they're in my number three. Yeah. Great. Great. Um, Good choice. All right. My number three selection was, uh, was tough dude. You know me, man. Like I go crazy making these lists. I get just, it makes, it stresses me out. I, cause there's so many factors and you know, whatever, but, uh, my number three selection, I had to go with the, uh, golden voice himself. Uh, Mr. Steve Perry of journey. I couldn't even imagine hearing this guy in their auditions back in the day. I, I don't care who you are. Like you, if you were like sitting there, you can't deny the nutty vocal range of this guy. And I'm sure my buddy Brent Kipling will agree with me. Uh, listening to Steve Perry. Yeah. It's there's some cheesy music and stuff like that, but that guy had some pipes, man. So Steve Perry is my number three selection. Right on. And then we're going into number two. So Lee, what do you have for your number two? I mean, I mean, I'm just going to build on what you just said because my number two is Steve Perry and I'm not even a journey fan. Yeah. But like anybody with a gas pedal that big, that can just walk in and smash it. That dude had, had vocals that, were insane Agreed. and to come in there whoever the poor guy was that was the lead singer before him oh, yeah. uh you just it, and it and it's almost irrelevant it isn't you know we talk about oh it's the same band with the same name and the same band members that's not the same band i need to add that it, to the list robert fleischman doing wheel in the sky because it's on the net i'll i'll add it on there <laughs> and it's not bad you listen to it and right. you're like you're like it's this isn't bad it's it's not bad at all it's good but it's not steve perry like it's right, crazy right. i'm I mean, it's, it would be like watching, you know, um, I don't know, Chris Carson run in his prime and Bo Jackson. They're both sure. running backs in the NFL and both deserve credit, but Bo Jackson has Bo Jackson. Right. And uh, <laughs> Steve Perry is next level. He's just, he's top level. He's, yeah. It's hard to get somebody in that game that has that kind of power that can show up and do that. He just had a huge engine and a huge gas pedal and just destroyed everything he did. So even as a non-Journey fan, yep. he makes my number two. It's good that you're uh, you're grading it like that because that's how I kind of looked at this too. Um, all right, Ethan, who is your number two? My number two is another band from my wheelhouse, Iron Maiden. Because once again, like once my sheer fandom, Bruce Dickinson was a game changer, took that band to a whole different level and arguably one of the most successful metal bands in all of history. I know maybe not by radio market and like how much they're played on radios, but yeah, uh, the, the money they generate from touring, the, the absolute just hysterical fandom and, and the fact that they still sell out shows worldwide uh, prior to the pandemic <laughs> right, was right. just absolutely incredible and, and so influential in my show. So Iron Maid's my number two. Awesome, man. Well, uh, I got to tell you, my number two is also Iron Maiden. Woo! Wow. Josh, Iron I love Maiden. you. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, my number two, it's, uh, you know, they're not known for their radio hits. Uh, I mean, I don't think of it. I don't know if I've ever heard him on the radio. Maybe like, the hills, the maybe hills. yeah, maybe great song. It should have been played on the radio more, but I mean that man, like Ethan said, Bruce Dickinson is Iron Maiden. I don't care what anybody says. And we're not talking about the famous producer who worked with Will Ferrell in the blue Easter cult, you know, recording, you know, <laughs> don't fear the reaper. Uh, it's, it's just crazy how big this band is without having the help of like, hit singles that's it's kind of unheard of. even for big bands like you know metallica has enter sandman and they have a, a ton of other like huge songs but iron maiden they're just they're that good they have like fantastic live performance and like i'm not a huge iron maiden guy but i get it again you watch you watch that first guy singing and then watch uh, bruce dickinson it's like it's a world of difference so so that's my number two and then lee what is your number one Number one selection on the list of greatest replacement singers. I mean, the, for me, this was a, a no brainer. It was uh, the greatest replacement rock singer in history is, is Brian Johnson. Uh, Brian Johnson. A ACDC was, uh, you know, we talked about Van Halen being the biggest band in the world, but then they kind of slowed down a little bit with Hagar. And I don't know necessarily whether they had more hits or more fans or whatever, but like you could tell, they weren't at the same tempo. They weren't at the same sort of volume. They weren't at the same level. And ACDC had, I think, three albums with Bon Scott. And they were huge. They were a huge, huge band. 
And then they pull this guy basically, like you said, like off a construction <laughs> site. And Bon Scott is not easy to replace. He's a really distinctive voice, a distinctive lead singer. It, it was it was distinctive. Yeah. And then, you know, like I said, you go from Highway to Hell and you listen to Back in Black, just the song Back in Black. So good. If so good. Well, and, and imagine if you were an ACDC fan and you knew Bon Scott was dead and the first song you hear is Back in Black and his Brian Johnson's vocals just explode. It's crazy, man. And, and he's right there. And immediately that's ACDC. And I, and I get the, the argument that there is a preference for Bon Scott before, but ACDC as a band never stopped. And they didn't really slow down. Like, yeah, no. And, and I mean, and, and, and to, and to add to that, they never changed. Th- th- <laughs> that's like, kind of what I'm saying is like, it, there was never a clear so, before and after. But, but what I'm saying is like this, clearly the singer is similar, but the, the music literally stayed the same. It wasn't like Van Halen went from like, you know, uh, you know, uh, oh, right. Panama right. to love walks in. You're like, well, that's right, a right, right. massively drastic change. Like right. in music. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, you know, you go, you go from highway to hell to, uh, you shook me all night longer back in black or hell's bells. And it's, it's like, it flows, man. And it's, yeah, it's yeah. I, I think that's what I'm saying. There's a yeah. continuity to it that, that I don't think exists in any, any other sort of rock replacement singer. I, yeah. I think, especially in their prime, like there are some people who come in and replace and they sound like the guy before or whatever. Sure. But Brian Johnson came in in a really tough situation in a really tough time with a gigantic band and didn't just do it. He killed it. He yeah. like he just yeah. destroyed. And, so and for he, me, it was a no no brainer. And I mean, he had Brian his own Johnson. image where, you know, he had that. Yeah, uh, yeah he wasn't trying to be Bon Scott. The, yep, exactly. Exactly. And he respected him. He didn't. When, right. when, when I heard him in that interview say, I, I think he actually said, I've never done. Maybe he said he's done it once or something like that. But he's never done that song. You know, the bagpipe song. Uh, it's a long way to the top. If you want to yeah. walk around that, he goes, that's Bon's song. I don't I don't right. do that. I don't do that song. And I was like, wow. Right. That's cool, man. People, people, yeah. people listen to that. Obviously, I listen to it because uh, you know I heard I heard him say it once. So, uh, right. so, yeah. Ethan, who is your number one selection? Well, Lee said it all, man. That was ACD for the same reasons. I mean, honestly, like uh, the fact that, like you said, the, the band did not lose a step and continue to produce the same music. Like the joke, right? The running joke is all the ACDC songs sound the same, but yeah. you know, at the same time. Not exactly. And the fact that there were so many big hits, like I can still remember hearing Thunderstruck for the first time and just going, what? Like that, re- I mean, just yeah. unbelievable. Back in Black, all of it. Like, I think my my first understanding of just how amazing the female form is, is hearing, you know, Shook Me All Night Long. <laughs> I started to really get a visual in my head when I heard rock, knocking me out with those American thighs. Because, man, yeah. you know, we have some ladies with some muscular level. Yeah, I got it. Like, I was <laughs> picturing it in my mind. I don't want to talk about it too much. I'm going to get excited here. <laughs> So needless to say, like that, Lee's really said it all, so I will waste some more time. But ACDC was my number one as well. Awesome. Awesome. I can't really argue with you guys because I, you know, I love all these bands. So, uh, but my number one selection on the list might, uh, might surprise you guys. Uh, but when it came down to it, I just, I kept going back to my criteria. Yes, I love Sammy Hagar of Van Halen. Yes, of course, I love Brian Johnson with ACDC, but... Did they make their band better? And in my opinion, not necessarily. I love both versions of both bands. And I, again, you guys have a solid, solid argument. Solid. Uh, And that's why with my number one selection of the greatest replacement of all time goes to the one-two combo knockout of Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham of Fleetwood Mac. I, just, I mean that's a solid choice. That's I just awesome. yeah. I think I, I think that I think that they brought way so much to that band and exploded them into stardom and kept them going for decades. Uh, so that's my pick. I I, I think it's kind of cheating because <laughs> because it's uh, adding two people, but they've all joined at the same time. So it's like one of those things where it's like I guess it's a, it could work. So so well, yeah. and mathematically, it means there's a tie because you had two and me and Ethan each had one. So there's no definitive winner here. <laughs> Is uh, Lee Matlock going to debate you on this? <laughs> is Lee Matlock? Oh, yeah, Lee Matlock wouldn't agree with this. Lee Mat—I don't know what Lee Lee Matlock would uh would suggest, but 
Maybe I'll ask him. Maybe I'll put in the put in the comments for you guys. But uh, wasn't that the band he liked the the original lead singer era yeah, better? Yeah, he liked uh, the Peter Green era, which is uh, <laughs> if you listen to that Peter Green song, like what's it called? Uh, 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 I don't know. I'm you, I love Lee Matlock. That is a man of principle. A man of principle. <laughs> hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. But you guys know that I, I actually saw, I actually had a chance to see Nirvana's replacement singer along with my brother in 2013. Did you guys know that? They had a replacement There's, singer? What? Yeah. For one they're, show. They're tour- who are they touring with? Well, it was uh, Paul McCartney. <laughs> wow. Okay. It was a Paul McCartney <laughs> show and they brought out a, okay, it's not really a. Uh, replace some singer. Okay, so anyway. that brings up one that I actually had in my notes. <laughs> I think you know where I'm going to go with this. Go ahead. Uh, man. He's not, but it's hard to pick a lead singer. Who's the lead singer of the Beatles? Is it John or is it Paul? It's or is it John, George? Paul, and George, and Ringo on one song right. on each album. <laughs> so, so I can say this with probably uh, some background: the best replacement ever was Paul McCartney. <laughs> <laughs> Well played. I mean, Paul died, right? <laughs> oh, that's great. That is awesome. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, guys, we're going to have to wrap this up. Uh, so now that we gave everyone our lists, we want to hear from you. So uh, who is your favorite replacement singer of all time? And be sure to leave a comment below because we want to hear it. And, uh, and guys, I definitely want to thank you both for coming on the show today. And uh, we got to do this again sometime. Uh, what do you guys think? Absolutely. It was a blast, oh, yeah. Josh. I awesome. love this. Awesome. This is awesome. So we're going to branch out, do some different things, and um, do some different lists, some weird kind of things like that. That was the original idea for the show. And, and Lee, I got to thank you for bringing it up to me you know, a few weeks ago about doing something like with uh, music, too. So take care, both of you. Uh, we'll talk to you soon, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Right on. Great to talk to both of you. Yeah, I miss you guys. <laughs> Later, man. Thank you for tuning in to the Josh and Friends podcast. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, feel free to leave a message in the comment section below. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and follow the show. And check out some of the video clips posted on YouTube and Facebook. I'm Josh, and thank you for being a friend.